Hey guys, Starkit here, and today we're joined by Brittlene, RiseQT, Nuggy, and Octavian to talk everything Metamorph, the new Atlas, the new story stuff, and a bit of method racing. Before we get into all of that, Rise, what have you been up to? I've been gaming. A lot of gaming. Most fun league in a long time. For the wrong reasons. It's not because of Metamorph. Well, I guess it's the right reasons. It's not because of Metamorph, although Metamorph is pretty cool. Conquerors of the Atlas is like... Great. Exactly what I wanted out of PoE for years. Make the game hard, make the game kick my ass all the time. Not that it wasn't before, but now it's doing it in uh, much more, you know, consistent fashion. Let's just say that. And uh, yeah, it's been really fun. I'm playing like a ball lightning miner guy now because they crafted like the most ridiculous helmet mm. ever. I was like just throwing around. I was trying to craft hybrid gear for a Stormbrand character, and then I ended up crafting. For whatever reason with a metallic fossil and i just said to myself like oh why am i crafting with a metallic but let's just do it whatever because it was an inquisitor right and then yeah it's like triple tier one uh energy shield and minus nine lightning res and it's just like yeah i made an entire character around it <laughs> how much uh, yes it's 300 it's 20 quality because again i was just fucking around with like a random helmet right so it's like right. 360 or something you should, so, uh, you should see if you good. get the 30 quality beast. Yeah. the I'm trying to get uh, Hillock. Is it Hillock? Too. Yeah, yeah, Hillock and Fort, yeah. I think, for armor. Yeah, but he, he has not been cooperating. In general, my uh, Syndicate members have not been cooperating this league. It's been kind of very gruesome. But yeah, that's pretty much it. And other than that, uh, tried to do the Awakener thing. Got pretty close. Mm -hmm. But then a bunch of homeless people got me. Uh, I should probably learn my lesson and stop running uh, extra projectiles maps because it feels like every league, it's that that gets. Oh, me. I thought I thought you meant you got pretty close in the boss fight. I was trying to figure out what aspect of the boss fight qualified as a bunch of homeless people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a secret phase four. I had, I had like everything down and I was like, oh, I just need to, because I still needed my watchstones because I messed up real bad on one of the days. I was just like, oh, the watchstones, you know, they're pretty quick. But that was around the time when I still had before 16. And then once you hit 16, oh. it's like you can't. And so I was just like, oh, I need gear anyway. I'm just going to focus on gearing today. No problem. And then I realized that watchstones take forever. So I was still like behind on watchstones. And then eventually I made the second character, and I would, and I, I died to to, to Drox, dude. Uh, yeah, it was brutal. He fisted me real hard. Yeah. A loop around, I like that one. See, one. I I was taking like zero damage to him on my previous character, mm -hmm. and then he just like completely blasted me on the Wait, on the new the, one. So uh, new character. <laughs> it, they were both explosive arrow, but I think I just never got the big fist. Oh. Yeah. And apparently he gets like a stacking damage bonus and my character couldn't deal like... Oh, really? Yeah. Amazing. I thought he just takes less damage and then he's got the little waves and then yeah, he yeah, yeah. The, like a little buff, but he has like little purple charges and apparently those make him deal oh. less damage, more damage. I thought they make him damage. take less, I didn't but it make him do more. Whoa, and so, whoa, yeah. Whoa. I didn't know that either. He I once have fisted me super hard out of nowhere because I never took damage from him before. And I've done him on uh, four watchstones before. It was like super reasonable. Here's just like clean hit. Mm -hmm. See you later. I think I had like uh, 40k armor or something, 7.5k life. Just blasted me, dude. It was crazy. And fortify. And he was taunted by my totem. So I was also taking, uh, and by myself too. So I was taking like, literally 50% less damage. He hit me for like 16k mm -hmm. EHP essentially. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was not nice. <laughs> it surprised Fuck me a little Drox. bit. Yeah, Drox is a beast. Seems good. That's good. Uh, what about you, Brutal? What have you been up to? Um, I started as a Toxic Rain Trickster just because it was a comfortable bow starting. Um, currently in the transition to Cold SA and I hit 32 watchstones on Friday. It feels pretty good, man. Um, so I guess the goal now is to learn the Awakener fight a bit better and then getting the Darkness Runner online so I can farm up fossils to craft a bow and some other gear. What, league what is you the... I, I play in softcore trade. What's like a decent depth to 
farm fossils on now? Because I always get that question, but I I never well, tried to make a darkness guy. The the runner that I came up with um, last league starts at 200 and can go all the way down to five to six, depending. Um, mm -hmm. So that was in sort of like re response to them nerfing the fossil rates and how like it's less common to find them um, outside of the walls, like at a shallower depth. And 200 mm -hmm. is a good depth I did. Uh, I had a particular circuit in a frost zone that made me, like, it was like 270 to 320 chaos an hour um, just running. Um, so it's really passive currency. It's not like any sort of gigantic amount, but certainly over time it adds mm -hmm. up. And mm -hmm. it's one of those things that's really approachable for a wide variety of players because it's just running around and picking up loot off the ground. And is it, like, at those depths, is it primarily walls still, or is it just... Um, no, this is um, like complete farming outside of the walls. If you break a wall, you oh. lose the ability to reset the node. Oh, you mean to rerun it over and mm -hmm. over. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why it's Damn. no sulfite repetitive farming. Gotcha. Have you tried it all to like go really deep and actually run the zones and all, all of that? Because it does feel like the deeper you get, the more fossils there are behind walls. And yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, you can do that or... like on the main character. So it's like a combination of both. Like I go down with like what's considered my main and I break the walls along the way there and sort of get what I'm going for. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as the farmer, it's more about targeting those more common fossils that are outside of the walls. So between the two of them, you um, you have a pretty well-rounded supply. Um, but this one, the, the Darkness Runner really operates just like the one from Delve League. You have like dual Ichimanjis and you just run, 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 run as yeah. fast as you can. Nice. So around 200 is like a solid 200 bet. for sure. Um, you can survive as long as you can take a um, hit uh, because of there's some shenanigans going on with Inigon Agnostic and some mana flasks um, to counterbalance the uh, the darkness stacks. And so as long as you can survive a hit, you can usually, you can go as far down as that your EHP allows. And that's sort of mitigated by like how much mom you have. Like if you have a double clarity watcher's eye in addition to like what you get from the um, Hierophant node as a scion in addition to like just taking mine over matter. Like if you can get all the way up to 48% um, mom coverage, like you can, you can take quite a bit. Have you made like a guide for like Harrison? Yes. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a video there's guide one. out and I'm currently working on the written guide. Um, there's a lot of questions involved with the, the, the character and like how it works. So I'm, right now, what's taking the most bit of time is like fleshing out a fully comprehensive like FAQ section to it. Okay. Well, um, I'll leave a link to the video guide like under this video. So if anyone watching this on YouTube later, there'll be a link for that. Um, sure, that'd be awesome. Niggy, what about you? What have you been doing? Dying a lot. <laughs> it hasn't been a lot. Come on. <laughs> what? I died you... like. Ah, I guess it's only four times. You've been, I died, you've been I died pretty died reasonable lot, like... this league. I died a lot like early on. So we went EA first. That was not the right choice. So the EA as a bull character, like it's, uh, just you know, like no no totems. It has all the potential of being a great build. The problem is that if you don't get uh, if if the boss like moves a little bit too much or you know the metamorphs are like all over the place, like they're they're mm -hmm. they're speedy. So you don't get like a second to stand still and just blast them. So you can never get that like nice ignite off. And then you're just, you're so vulnerable in between because now you have to like find a new spot. And it was just, it was rough. Mm -hmm. It was really rough. It's like from a PUB perspective, it's such a good build. <laughs> but in practice, you need, you need real good gear. It has like the damage potential is sky high. But god damn, it's really hard to pull off, especially in solo cell fun. And especially with bows because bows don't naturally, they don't come like, with a great toolkit to, for surviving in hardcore, except right. for like champion can make it work, I would say, like pretty easily for surviving at least. Mm. So that was rough. Then we went cremation. God, I love that skill. Really happy that I went that way. Um, lots of different ways to scale the damage still. And sitting at right around 10k EHP with like 5k, uh, 5k recovery per second. 
it's and to it's be that was like crazy actual hp though right because you say ehp and a lot of times it's like hybrid it can be gimmicky okay, you have so like there, actually 10k hp right? i had like 11k with the calms version that i died <laughs> on because i was an idiot like actually like closing in an 11k i was like 10 8 um the one i have right now is eight and a half k life with 1500 es but it's with soul tether mm, so you get nice. the full life recovery on the es so it's still like the you know the full leech on the on the es so it's like it's like a 3000 or something when it's all mm. popping on the es so it actually works for the es and that's a chieftain right where did you go with yeah. that over necro uh because you get bleach it's just everything you get from chieftain just kind of like feeds into the build Mm -hmm. um and it's just uh i i like the tanky builds that just kind of recover their life a lot versus block though the block builds are like super strong right now but it's just i don't know with the cremation actually leeching while you're running around so you don't have to like kind of like it, it's just kind of like free region mm -hmm. the leech mm -hmm. it's pretty it's pretty damn nice with cremation on, on chieftain because you don't really get that on uh on necro yeah. If you want it on Necro, you need like a leech neck, but that's really hard to get a good one and then anoint it and all that. It's yeah. yeah. A piece of advice: I've been trying to craft a lightning leech neck uh, yeah. with uh, the Crusader guy. The influences. It is fucking mm. impossible. Okay, yeah. I use like 20, 25 metallic fossils. None. Okay, zero. Then I crafted it with uh, like probably fifty chaos nothing 50 alks nothing eventually pure desperate i haven't seen the mod once pure <laughs> desperation because on poe db it shows that it's 500 the ratio of it which is like not that rare that's not that crazy so i started yeah, crafting it waiting. with uh, the the vendor recipe with where you get the onyx amulet and the three mm -hmm. different gems just so i can save on scours because i had a lot of alks still nothing i did get like a crazy ass amulet but never saw the mod. No, I, I think I ended up seeing it once in the in the mm. very end. But it was like on an absolute trash. <laughs> good to, so. Qualifies as a life mod, so pristines would encourage it potentially. But you know, good luck getting a lot of pristines until it's all found. Yeah. Um, I'm actually. You know what? I considering... did craft it. I did craft just real quick to close up on that because if that's the case, then I absolutely fucked myself because I did craft it with dense and. Oh, metallic. Oh, yeah. yeah, if you were oh, using yeah. dense, it might have been impossible to get it. But to oh, be fair, that was twenty. I don't know if it qualifies as a life mod. It could, actually. <laughs> that could be it too. But it would. <laughs> it wasn't that much. It was like maybe uh, ten denses or so. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, heads Anyways. up, everybody. This might happen to you, okay? Right. <laughs> I think it doesn't qualify. I think it qualifies the lightning. I don't. I mean, I could check. I could go check right now. No, don't. Just don't. No, I don't no, want it's happening. I'm checking. I'm checking. Check I'm right checking now. Too. Uh, jewelry, amulet. <laughs> what, what? What class was it? Redeemer? Did you say? Uh, crusader. I think. Crusader. Yeah, yeah, lightning guy. Crusader. Uh, yeah. Uh, Lightning Leech does life has a life tag, yes. Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> okay, that was like still only like 10, okay? Was and I was trying to get before? pen. There's also pen, all right? I was trying to get that. And most importantly, <laughs> I was trying to get plus one to all gems, which also didn't happen. And but that's not a life really. Were you stopping if you didn't get the leech? No, I was trying to just get any of the good mods. Oh, okay. But the leech, the leech was most important. <laughs> So, I mean, it was the most important, okay? I didn't care about it, actually. I didn't care about it at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what made that even better for me is it just reminded me of you crafting that fucking ES helmet in SSF, and I always go back to that one rise clip. You're like, oh, this helmet's sick. Scour. And then you're like, oh. Mm. Yeah, that wasn't... The, the problem was there wasn't, like, a crazy helmet. It was just really... It was, like, exactly what I needed at that moment. I get so excited that instead of, like, removing a mod from it, I scoured it, like, entirely. Yeah, that's good. Old Masters. It was good. On the crafting... Well, this is not much of a craft, but it's it's very exciting. I think I found my... The best weapon drop I've ever found in PoE. And I pick up a lot of stuff off the ground. I'm, like, notorious for, like... 
you know, picking up things to ID. So I did a metamorph and it, it dropped me a incursion weapon, a basil axe. So I got the, uh, the fist roll, you know, the good, uh, incursion fist roll. Oh. Yes. And then I, I, I looked at it. I was like, okay, T1 attack speed. Nice. T1 strength. Nice. Some fire damage. Ah, cause it was like 40 to 70. It's like, I can, okay. I can craft flat on there until I look at it again. It's flaring. Nice. <laughs> so it's like 650 something, like just as a drop. If I then smack a warlords on there, it's potential 800, 850. What? <laughs> if I hit it, the big one. If I hit the small one, it's like 780. If I hit the big one, it's like 850. Jesus Christ. Yeah. What is that? That's a, you said axe? Yeah, yeah. It's an abyssal axe. Damn. It's an incursion abyssal. Yeah, it's it's T1. Uh, like it's it's T1 uh, flat fist, attack speed, and strength. I like found that. I can build around that. Yeah, I will. Don't. At some point. <laughs> See, I found like a no, 700. I, I found like a 700 PDPS Coronal Mall. And I was like, ooh, maybe we could make a build around this. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. And I started theory crafting the build. It is fucking impossible to make two handers work. Like, no, 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 no. It's at, possible. Like dual wielding 350 PDPS swords is going to be always like better. No, 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 no. And I have, I have hard ideas to get already. <laughs> You'll, you'll see, dude. No, 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 you'll see. You'll see. This is going to be the greatest. <laughs> okay, Quinn, you. calm down. Someone Quinn. here is in denial. Dude, I'm, I'm going like EQ or something. It's going to be great. Two hand last. Yeah. Right? Wait, can you go Juggernaut, right? it's going to stun. Dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Stun. <laughs> Anyways. No stun. What about your saving? What shit items have you been IDing? Um, I haven't ID'd anything particularly good. I've been doing a ton of crafting. I, uh, I betrayed Tarky. I started yeah, in Tarky's private league, in the Mustard Socks League, as it's called. Um, but the build that I was playing, Toxic Ray Mines, I had played Solo Cell Found at the end of last league, which is why I did it as my starter, because I knew it would be strong, because um, basically nothing about it got changed in the patch notes. And, yeah, I mean, it, it lived up to it. It's quite strong. Um, but... The reason I transferred into Trade League was because I really wanted to see how far I could potentially push it. I hadn't played Softcore Trade in a while, and I hadn't like actually properly min-maxed a build to the nth degree in a while. So it was fun to do that, and um, it goes real, real, real far. It kills like four Watchstone uh, Conquerors in about five seconds. Toxic Rain Mines is pretty nutty. Um, managed to craft essentially the Dream Bow yesterday with it. Uh, it has plus two bow gems, plus one gems, T1 dot multi, crafted uh, chaos dot multi, additional arrow, and phasing on kill. I hate you so much for that. Yeah. Two reasons. <laughs> that bow, bow, that bow is the craziest thing I think I've ever seen in PoE. Like, it is stupid. I could have slammed cull on top of, uh, instead of the phase. It could have been better. It, it is insane. And then on top of it, yeah, I, I keep like struggling with choosing a build. I'm a, I'm like, oh, I want to play this. I want to play this. And I keep trying to like work CI into it. And people were talking about your toxic rain guy. And now I, I have a severe craving for like toxic rain mines. And I hate it because I want to play other stuff. And uh, it's very good. Yeah. Um, too many builds. And I've actually managed to make it feel like decently tanky as a life-based version too, which I didn't really think I'd be able to do. But I went for Wind Dancer and Kintsugi, both of which give 20% less damage taken if you haven't been hit recently, and then just stacking a bunch of evasion and dodge. And like, I was doing the Awakener fight and a storm, I was being an idiot, and I stood underneath Cyrus while he spawned a storm. So a storm spawned on me and I got out of it alive because the damage over time from it gets mitigated by the 20% less because it's not technically a hit, so it doesn't break that. So I was able to get out of it before dying. Yeah. Doesn't it, like, knock you back, though? The storms? No. Yeah. If you want to stand in the middle of it, it'll let you. It'll just kill you. No, 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 when it's spawning, though. No. Not that I noticed. That's a different phase as the pushback, as far as I'm aware. The Kintsugi mm -hmm. wind dance combo is really good. Like, I use that combo in, like, five different builds in legion i think it was and it was just like every setup was like traps do it dots do it and that was one mm -hmm. thing i think i was doing 
course to carry Trickster, and because Trickster also has the reduced damage every time taken stuff, it meant that like if I did Shaper or like Elder, I could just like stand in beams and be like, I don't take any damage, and then you're like, okay, I should probably move now. But yeah, um, yeah, I kind of want to try it with an assassin. Um, do some sort of setup with assassin Kintsugi Wind Dancer because then you have the reduced damage taken if there's what one enemy nearby or some one unique enemy nearby. And then you also, if you go poison, have reduced damage taken from damage over time. So you could probably just like walk through the des desolation and not care. Yeah, I didn't think Sounds about like that. Assassin was really good for Awakener because that fight has no ads. Yeah. yeah. I feel like in general, people are kind of, well, I don't know if it's like a hardcore thing, but people don't seem to play assassins, which is weird because they. I so was very them. surprised because like Mistwalker yeah. is, in my yeah, opinion, good. one of the strongest ascendancy nodes in the game. Just like straight yeah. up, Mistwalker is insane. But it, I think it's it's positioning on the tree. Like Assassin is harder to get enough EHP on because you're on the top right of the tree if you want to go like life based. But even that said, ES based Assassins seem like they'd be very strong for hardcore. I mean, that's mm, yeah. kind of bullshit because people have been playing mines for ages and like Sab starts in the same part of the tree. Like people complain about top right of tree. It isn't that difficult to get like six, seven K life. And like a shit ton acro or go glancing blows and get do uh, block cap. Like it's not that difficult. Yeah, but I, I feel like, right? If again, if we're talking about hardcore, it's like uh, six, seven k life right now, and acro is just not enough. I think. Just don't <laughs> like... get hit rise. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. you need, it's fine you need until it's some form of. Yeah. You need some form of hard mitigation behind it. I yeah. I yeah. think that six to seven k life with a kintsugi. Like that, I could see being enough if you have good avoidance on top of that. Um, it certainly isn't as tanky as Champion or Juggernaut or something. It isn't as completely un, uh, completely forgiving, but I think in the hands of a skilled player, it could definitely you know make it all the way into the high nineties in hardcore. You know, I played the um, last league, it, which admittedly I think was a lot less rippy than this one. This league is a lot more rippy because of Conqueror. Even just Conqueror mobs in maps, like Hunter mobs, are so goddamn scary. But I don't find them scary. It's played... the zappy boys, those are the spookers. Oh, the Baron enemies? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen those guys. Really scary. Like They're nasty. Thousand. It's like a blue mob, single attack, no map mods. I saw a guy get hit for like seven, eight thousand. Like, yeah. dude, what? <laughs> it's ridiculous. I. They're scary. I find them a little bit easier to manually avoid than the Al Hazmin enemies. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just bad. Well, the thing about the Hunter mobs is that I felt like, but again, this isn't like a super tanky champion, but I feel like once I had like 20, 30, Can't eventually get like 50 Chaos Res, they were just doing yeah. nothing, like yeah. zero. Because yeah. they almost shotgun me, like if they spawn with extra projectiles, they will, like the the little pukey boys, they will just <laughs> destroy. So I was just always swapped to the cast on death helmet anytime I did that. And once you had the... The chaos res for it, it was like, eh. yeah, yeah, yeah I've been sitting lot. at negative 10 chaos res this week. Oh, so yeah. yeah, that would work on that. Um, for sure. Yeah, so my first build of the league was Course of the Carry Trickster. Well, okay, so I, I went on a bit of a journey. So, like Noogie, I was like, Explosive Arrow looks really hot. I want to play Explosive Arrow, but I was like, I think it might be trash. So, I'll league start Fireball Trickster, and then I can try it and see if I like it. So I tried it and I was like, this doesn't seem good. And then played Fireball to like low 70s, then respect into Corsica because Corsica got buffed. And being a trickster with like 30 Chaos Res, um, taking zero damage from those hunter guys. But what was funny about it is I was casting the method stuff and watching Rise freaking out about like these guys screwing him up. And I was watching like the, the hat swap moments. Like, oh God, these guys are going to be so spooky. So the first time I'm mapping with them, they're not doing anything. I'm like, oh, these are really easy. And I like check, it's like positive 30 chaos res, like trickster, loads of damage and avoidance. I'm like, okay, fair enough. Um, yeah. Played that until... I don't, I don't think I even played it for that long. I think I played just like 88 or something. Then I watched Norse's stream, and Norse was face tanking Awakener with an explosive arrow chieftain. And he was just doing the full, I'm just going to stand right in front of the boss, kill you in like two seconds. And then I'm like, oh, Explosive Arrow is a good build. Let's play Explosive Arrow. And then I ran into all the problems that Niggy had. Explosive Arrow is, like, legitimately one of the dumbest bosses right now. If your build can, like, stand on top of the boss. 
it feels really awkward for mapping for me, and it's fucking awful for Blight. Explosive Arrow and Blight is like... Bleh. Um, mm. So, I'm now Sometimes playing nice Mine, though. and Mine just feels great, because Mine's are good. I, I can recommend Totems. After my rip, I uh, equipped the... Because I never got the Doriani. I got the Doriani and the uh, Six Link Cool Rain. And I went to do Shaper, and it was just... After a second, just... Because HP like this. It was mm. insane damage. But he doesn't yeah. move nearly as much mm. as Awakener or especially Metamorphs. Those guys <laughs> are pretty ridiculous. Yeah, that was one of the really annoying things about... I don't know what causes it. Um, this is an issue with having my Corsica character. If you have a boss that jumps, like the goat boss, um, and then certain metamorphs like stack haste on it, and because I'm in a hasted league as well, it gets like crazy multiplied. The metamorph dude spent more time underground than above ground. Like he was just permanently just like zip zagging around. And because of that, he was never in any of my Corsica clouds. And I swear to God, I spent like five minutes killing this dude. <laughs> And whenever he popped up, his health would, like, drop, but then he would just be, like, invulnerable for, like, a straight minute, and I'm just like... Hmm. But, yeah. So, I'm now playing a, a Pyroclast Mine uh, Sab with Cloak of Defiance, and it's really nice playing a straight, like, traditional Mine of a Mana build. I hadn't played one in a really long time. And you, um... I'm low... Oh, what were you going to say, sorry? Did you get your Astral Projector yet? No... Oh. I'll, I'll explain why I want that in a bit, but the problem is by explaining why I want it, it makes it harder to get it. So anyway, but <laughs> so the the we'll defense of my build, I'm, I like, I only just got it to maps. Like I'm only like 85, 86 or something, and I've got like 4k mana, 4k life, like 2k es, and I'm using the new Awakener helmet, which gives all the transfigurations. So the helm gives 21% life, 21% mana, 21% es. And then 30% of your mana is generic damage, 30% of your ES is spell damage. So the helm's giving me something like 120% increased damage and 21% life and 21% mana. And it's got a good amount of armor and ES in it, so it's like a really easy just like equip in this build. Um but yeah, so Astral Projector is a ring that can only drop from metamorph fights in Tain's lap and it's just a chance you don't need to fully complete oh. the bar there's just a chance you'll get a metamorph unique that's the ring that means that your nova skills can be targeted at the enemy so the first person i saw do anything cool that was red i was playing shockwave totems and it means with shockwave totems it like targets off screen what a lot of people don't know is pyroclast mine is a nova ability so your minds then have smart targeting and the thing which is dumb about Pyroclast Mines is if you fully set up on a boss, you delete it. But you've played the build race. You know if the boss moves, it fucks your damage up. Well, it doesn't care because if the boss moves, then the mines just move with it. Um, and it also means that you can Damn. use it as a really good clear skill because you can throw a mine at your feet and it will target stuff like on the edge of the screen. Um, so it turns Pyroclast Mines into like a good clear skill and a even better single target skill when it was already like a ridiculous single target skill um so i really want one but i'm in a private league and not a single one has dropped yet and it's a case of me just nagging people to run their metamorphs like but Taka, i haven't got any eyes drop so i'm hoping that eventually when ggg works out what's going on with the organs then suddenly we can run like mm. 300 and what are you going to say sir so strat for eyeballs that I've been doing on uh, on my stream yesterday. I played around with it a little bit. If you Horizon Orb any T7 map, it becomes Precinct. Yep. Any T7 map, it becomes Precinct. Precinct is a multi-boss map, yep. so it's very easy to get eyeballs out of the boss because there's like four bosses. You, I found about 66% of the time, two thirds, you'll get an eyeball from one of the bosses. So if you take your T7 maps, throw Horizons at them, turn them all into Precincts, and then just run through and rush to the boss, kill enough stuff to get a Metamorph put, completed, you can farm eyeballs pretty quickly doing that. Yeah, I got like I, an eyeball every couple of minutes. I've been farming mm. multi-boss maps, uh, so I'm running the fights as much as I can. The problem is, is I'm effectively trying to farm it like SSF style. So until everyone else in my private league <laughs> does the same thing, I'm effectively trying to SSF farm a league-specific unique, which is a really low drop chance. So yeah, hopefully I get it eventually, but oh well. That sounds fucking cool, though. It's, it's really Thunder cool. It's also really cool. like just a good oh, ring. It's not yeah. just... Yeah. That sounds cool. Yeah. Mm. But, um... 
yeah. So other than that, and then casting the method race, that's kind of everything I've been up to since. Wait, how were the just real quick oh. the shockwave? How were the shockwave totems from Red Eye? Uh, yeah, they were good. They were good. Um, it solves the main issue you had with that build, where so for anyone who hasn't played it totems sucked. in a while, specifically shockwave totems. <laughs> their damaging aoe is significantly larger than their targeting aoe so what can happen is you can like drop them they'll kill some like half a pack and then because the rest of the pack is too far away they just don't do anything until the mob slowly walk towards it um whereas by having it so they can like fire off screen it fixes all of those problems and it substantially increases the survivability of the totems because you don't only need to drop the totem in the middle right. of the pack and the main issue you have is how far can it shoot to the edge of the screen? Yeah, literally. Like, how, how long is it? Wow. Any like, I'm just, like, thinking, any like, how long the targeting edge range. of the screen. Yeah. You could do it wow. with um, Dark Pack Totems, too. Yeah. It's a similar effect. Oh, damn. Yeah. And those, I think... <laughs> no offense to Shockwave Totems. Um, yeah, dumb. Those, I think, can <laughs> scale damage a little further. Yeah. Ooh, dude. And Assassin, Dark Pack, no, Dark no pack Totems. Yeah. Um, it's a really, really cool item. And it's being slapped on really hard. I also I really am. like Fury Valve, which is another metamorph specific amulet. That's oh, really good. That one, that one actually makes Lancing Steel a kind of cool ability. Yeah. Which one? Fury Valve. It, it makes do? it sort of into like the the oh. way it changes the behavior makes it sort of like a. Someone in my chat was playing around with it. They Frost described it as a physical frost blades. Yeah. Yeah. Which is neat. Um. Turkey, I'm going to disappoint you immensely here. I, I did a metamorph and dropped one of the rings basically immediately after transferring out of your private. Fuck thing. you, Octavian. I don't like him. Fucking shit player. <laughs> well, that's the uh, that's the last bay class I'm on. Yep. So, sure. so, hmm. What was next on the topic list? So we don't dwell just, on just, that. Just me sulking. It's just an hour and a half of Taki <laughs> sulking in, in dead silence. Um, okay, so method stuff. So we're very lucky in the fact that we had two people who raced in, in the method event, and then we had three people who casted it. Um, Brittle, a lot of people know you from your casting, but they don't necessarily know like more of that. Would you like to explain your involvement in the method race? Uh, sure. Um, it kind of goes back to sort of like the larger history of my involvement with racing. I don't know how much time we have. Go for it. 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> 20 hours. My goodness. Um, so I guess a little bit about my history and the involvement in racing is I, I first got involved back in January, uh, mostly because I happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was hanging out with Trix and his stream and Camel stopped by. And the longer story short is that I ended up being invited to cast the January race, which was like the level 85 duos. And I declined <laughs> because I, I wanted to learn more. Um, I'd only been playing PoE for like a year and a half at that point, And I, I knew nothing about racing. I had no sort of reputation to carry me in terms of PoE knowledge. I still was learning every day. But I'd, I'd been around long enough to understand the importance of racing to PoE, even if I had like mostly missed out on all of the race events and seasons that GGG used to sponsor. Um, and so as a person, like as a new person stepping into something that has this sort of legacy, like I knew I wouldn't make it or be accepted if I didn't just like put my head down and go really hard at this. Um, so I worked behind the scenes mostly with the first one. It was a it was a good way to like absorb Octavian and Ziggy and sort of like set a benchmark for myself personally as for what I should aspire to. Um, and it also taught me a lot about like what I didn't know and where I needed to focus my research on. And at the time, the casts were mostly just like multi Twitch and Google Docs as far as um, coordination. But as I began to prepare for like what would be like my casting debut, I guess if we have to call it something, um, would be, I, I just started doing interviews and getting to know some of the racers and talk to them. And it was really evident in talking to them that this was sort of like a stain on the relationship between GGG and the players. Like there was racing was something that was universally missed and talked about with like almost this infectious sort of longing that this is something that like they were upset was gone. And I knew I'd never be a racer. <laughs> and uh, despite being an outsider to the racing community at the time, I felt like compelled 
to do whatever it is that I could to help like make racing survive. And so my focus and my goal became to sort of like improve the visual experience for those watching the race. Like if we could adapt some good practices from like, because BOE sits between eSport and speed running. Like it's really one of those things that can't be clearly defined. And so if we could pull some best practices from both of those and create like a compelling cast, then like we'd be showing the community that at least like we're serious about it. Um, like maybe that would in time lead to it being like appreciated and more people would tune in more and more interest. And then like, maybe just maybe in like some universe, GGG goes, Oh, Hey, look, there's a lot of people watching this. Maybe we should do this again. Um, <laughs> so I was able to bring together like a, a collection of developers, um, some who had already been involved with the, the racing scene and a couple that were not, you know, that just came in together with me. And we basically created an entire um, tool set and like set of uh, applications and stuff just to use within racing. Uh, we we shaped largely what have be has become like the base PoE racing experience and created a new standard. Um, so when you turn into it, that is like the culmination of ten months of work for all of us. Um, like. Just I guess to shout out the main people, Mukvi is the is the brilliance behind the the casting tool, which started as like a simpler player to replace multi twitch, but it, it grew into an entire system that coordinates the casters with their support crew beautifully, like in a beautifully efficient manner, all while managing the viewer experience as well. And it was specifically designed to be streamer friendly, so that anyone could access and deploy the tool in real time, no matter where they were in the world, because PUE is an international game. Um, Pertinex is basically the Chris Wilson of the behind the scenes crew. Um, he's a jack of all trades as well as being like godly fast clipper. Um, he's also the brain behind the Atlas bot program. So in this past cast, if you notice that we were like bringing up different pictures of the Atlas to show like people's progression through the watchstones. Um, the reason why we have to do that is because we don't have API access to the Atlas. So he created... <laughs> A program that watches streams and by recognizing the compass in the center takes a picture. That picture gets sent to the tool and then we can display it. Yeah. Oh my god. I, I love your reaction, guys. They're <laughs> and so, riddle, like, riddle as if anything underselling this. Like the tool is, is fucking magic. <laughs> and um, of course then we have Sibrin, who is the like the brain behind PUE ladder. And I don't think there's anything else I need to say for anyone to understand his importance in this. I mean, PUE Ladder has been pretty ubiquitous in the racing community. I mean, not only for its ladder updates, but it integrates the rip clips. And then sometimes it has like the gear snapshots so you can see what people are wearing or what they're playing as their main skill. And uh, I guess my role, my role in all this has been sort of like a, a news producer and a manager more than anything else. So like we're all volunteers. But I, I more or less knew what I wanted the final product to be, and I had a good idea from casting, like, what features would be worth developing um, to assist with the coverage. And as the styles of races changed, because, like, there was, like, the Camel Duos race, and then there was an 85 race, and a 90 race, and then a class race. And so, like, the as the styles of the races changes, so did the requirements for the tech that goes along with it. And so my job was to anticipate these changes and focus development accordingly. So, like, we had to redo huge portions of the tool for the class race um, just to handle the challenge that we were going to have not only so many people um, to cover, but then how were we going to display that information in a digestible format for, for the, you know, the viewers. Organizing the, the ladder by uh, class was difficult, and this is one of the, the sort of things that we had to get over. <laughs> I'm going to take a moment to breathe, and then I'll continue. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I wanted to just oh. say quickly to attest at how good the uh, <laughs> casting tool is. I yes. managed to get it to work, and it only took me, like, six tries. <laughs> like, I did, it didn't work straight away, but, like, I got it working pretty quickly. So if I can get it Even to work... Even I know how to use it, and yeah. that's, like, every, yeah. huge success. Every single yeah. problem I've ever had with it turned out to be my fault in the end. Whoa. Yes. Nice. You're that's using it thing. wrong. That's, um, that's the best but, feeling every time, for sure, when you're like, yeah. this is not working right. It's like, no, you're actually just you're, dumb. You're just <laughs> stupid. You're just using it wrong. Um, but, like, this is all, 
without access to an API that would allow us to look at characters directly or allow us to look like yeah. Gretel said earlier, look at the Atlas directly. Like this is all stuff that's like grown up around this gated fence around the garden of of, of plenty that GDG could potentially allow us into by developing yeah. a tool or developing an API. I'm not trying to say they have it already and they're just holding it away from us. I'm sure there's development they, time that would go into that. But it, <laughs> they're like, very restrictive in the API that they they do allow us to access, and I understand why. Um, it's like kind of a side tangent, but at one point in time, GDG granted access to their API for. Um, people that were wanting to do some of the trade development and then people figured out how to sort of like game the system as far as knowing having access to the API and like what it entailed like them learning. Um, so like that's why some people have like some advantage um, when it comes to others that are using POE trade because they can directly manipulate the API. Um, so for them to grant us access to large portions of the the API that we need to further development. Um, I mean creating access probably isn't the problem it's just more or less like creating a like a a comfort level for them to give us that it's one of those things where if you were someone like open all who's now in the company they'd be like sure because we know you for this many years and it's, it'd be about building that relationship up um, i hope so i mean we've done everything possible or at least in like what i've been a part of and what i've been in charge of i've done everything possible to try and keep like our intentions as as serious as possible and um, so, like, in addition to all of that, I also, you know, I, I came into the role as, like, a caster, too. And I've, I've had, like, these two separate roles that have been very, like, one is the one that everyone knows about. And one is the other that sort of, like, stays behind the scenes. And um, when I first started casting, I definitely had to sort of, like, take it on the chin the first few casts because I was not exceptionally great at it. Um, I done a fair bit of research and had like opportunities to provide some knowledge, but I was still just immensely shy. And there is obviously some like parts of the community that was like pushing back. They're like, "Who the fuck's Brittlety?" <laughs> and um... that never goes away. No, it's not. <laughs> you gotta get over that. That never goes away. Yeah. Always... I mean, like eventually, I embraced it though for sure. Like instead of letting it be like the scarlet letter, I just used every opportunity like that I could. To show that like I was doing the research, right? Like I was putting the time in that like I knew I was still sort of like this outsider, this nobody, but I could like at least show through my efforts that like I was serious about it. Um nice. And I knew behind the scenes like we were doing great things as far as the development was concerned. And I was immensely proud of that, even if like no one really knew in the grand scheme of things like who I was. Um, but that's pretty much the story. That's uh, that's all all it is. I'm just some chick who gives a, a pretty big fuck about racing. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, one thing which was really cool about the tool, um, so for anyone who doesn't, like, n obviously most people don't know how it works, um, you have kind of two different windows. So you've got one window, which is the player. So anyone who watched the method race and you saw the screens, that would be the player. Then we had a separate window, which was the controls, and that was where we could choose. Do we show the ladder, who we have, where we position them? Do we go over to clips and stuff? Uh, but one of the things which was really cool about it uh, with how the method race was set up is they had like a main caster and then like a side caster. Um, but both casters could have access to the controls at the same time. Um, so for example, on the last caster that I did, which was me and Florks, um, originally I was meant to be streaming it, but there was a weird audio thing. So literally last second we swapped over to him streaming it. Um, and it was complete work completely seamlessly. And then for the next eight hours, both of us were just messing with the controls and it was completely fine with the multiple inputs. And that I think is really cool because usually the way that stuff like this tends to work is it's like, okay, one person has it. And as long as that one person is okay, everything runs fine. But if anything ever happens to that one person, it all like melts. The fact that you can swap things around that easily is so good. And mm -hmm. a testament of how easy it is to like control it remotely um, speaking of the case of when it didn't work, it was a problem that you had. So one of the issues that I had is we had like special like passwords basically to log into the controller. For whatever reason, the like access code I had didn't work. And it turns out that wasn't my fault. But I thought, well, what if I use someone else's access code? Would that work? So I loaded up the controller, used someone else's access code, and I could move the controller all fine. I'm like, oh, this is all working chill. This is completely no worries. 
And I look over to my second monitor during the method race, and I notice that the casters are freaking out, that the cameras are, like, moving without them. <laughs> and for a solid, like, five to ten minutes, I'd been, like, messing everything around. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and they're just like, why does it keep highlighting this, dude? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I was like, oh, log out, You've close seen this the window. five times already. Whoops. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So sorry to those guys, but no, the tools are great. you didn't like test with some random clip because you could you could import basically whatever <laughs> clip you want. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things that's grown over time, and it's been a, a real pleasure to be a part of. Um, like the the tool basically just started as like a, a glorified player, just so that we could like maybe put some some logos and like a background behind it and make it look a little bit fancy, and it's it's become so much more. Um, just the way it completely seamlessly integrates the support crew with the the casters themselves is really nice. Um, one of the main problems that we had in the past was communication, because the the casters have enough to worry about, especially when they're trying to like operate the tool as well. Like it's really hard to pay attention to Discord, to like to get clips or some sort of Google document. So our our goal has been to, as we add new features, make sure that it's all accessible within a single window. Um, so that it's just like very straightforward and there's no no room for mistakes really yeah the fact that you have like for example the rip clips going in automatically and then not only that but you have the if they're viewed they're like de-highlighted and if they're not viewed they're highlighted so it's really easy to sort through and it made mm -hmm. it especially helpful when it came to casting the method race because as much fun as i had casting the method race Eight hours of casting people fucking map is tedious as shit. <laughs> there were like a yeah. few occasions where it's like, okay, I my brain is turning off. This is like hour six. So we're just gonna watch like ten minutes of clips, guys. But it was really easy because I just I had them all there. So it's you know, you can just go through them. Um it was incredibly yeah, the... exciting to watch Rise attempt to recolor his gloves for the fifth time. <laughs> fifth? Fiftieth. Uh... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I would definitely say that yeah. casting this race and coordinating this race was was very challenging. There is a a host of differences between this and some of the other casts that we had done before that um, really set it apart as far as casting was concerned. And definitely, I think everyone felt how long those eight hours were. Mm. I mean, Campbell and I ended up resorting to making fun of Carve's breakfast Shut in up. order to fill time. So. Carl was actually These are really the things good that you have to do. Because Carl was streaming, but he was listening to the commentary. So as soon as I found that out, I was just doing a commentary on everything that Carl did. And you could see him laughing, like, as when he's like, oh, he's on this fight. You better not take that damage because he would die. And that'd be very embarrassing. All these people watching. And you could see him, like, trying not to break. Um, I was really disappointed with you, though, Rise. So I casted two yeah. days. And I had I was one goal. About to give you a compliment. I, had, I was like, I'm gonna compliment these guys. I had Fuck one you. goal. Get Rise to wave at the camera. Did Rise wave at the oh. camera? No. Yeah, that that one time. I don't even remember what it was. It was like some videos and It wasn't even experience. one time. I like I had your chat on my phone and I'd be like, yo, Rise, wave at the camera. You wouldn't even fucking read my message, dude. Oh you, really? You were like full race mode, who the fuck's Taki? Screw this guy. And then everyone chatted, yeah, be like that's... ignored, like, dude, it was it was feels bad, man. Very, that's very probable. It was rough. I, I get pretty rough. serious about my s yeah. silly video games sometimes, but uh, to be fair, I that's kind of what I thought too. That like casting the you know eight hours of mapping is maybe gonna get pretty tedious. But anytime mm -hmm. I asked about how it's going uh, with you guys, chat was always super positive, and everybody was extremely happy. So you guys all did a fantastic job, I think, because I I only heard really great things about it. And from yeah. the looks of it, I need to watch back some of it because there was a lot of shit talking. So I'm all about it. <laughs> there, was, there was quite the, a lot. The, um, the feel of the commentary was different than usual. Like it wasn't the um, the kind of commentary that you'd come to expect out of like a level 80 or 75 race or something where it's like very little dead air. There's there's always something being said. There's always, you know, the next piece of information being being deployed tactically to the chat. Instead, it was we were actually reading the chat and responding. It was more akin to streaming for eight hours than it was to commentating for eight hours. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, like, and and getting prepared for the the race too. Like, we, I had no idea the scope of like what the cast would be until Ziz made the announcement. Like, I knew that there was going to be a race. I knew that we were trying to groom new casters to like help us with this upcoming event. 
but I didn't know the promise of 24 seven coverage um, for, for the race until the awakener was dead until he made the announcement. And like mentally I was like crapping my pants because I, I knew it was going to be like this huge endeavor beyond anything, like even bigger than the class race that we had done. And that one, I remember how much planning went into that and how much we had to change the tool and everything like that. So it was just very like, oh goodness. And we have how long? All right. Um, <laughs> and there's some like red tape initially as far as like holding back certain resources. But um, since I didn't have any sort of like affiliation or I wasn't, you know, compelled to be in any sort of team, like I just like, I was able to like just sort of jump in and make sure everything was properly organized and staff. Like so one of the main challenges I think that we had to um is like the tool is used to interacting with a very like s small data set. Like if we have a, a level 80 race, we know exactly who's going to be cat like racing because it's a private league with this many people. And it's really easy to set up the tool to basically go grab the streams for that many people. But when it's opened up to the entire SSF hardcore, that's a lot of potential streamers to feed into the tool, which causes all sorts of um, sort of issues with how, okay, like how do we, teach the algorithm to pull the right people. Do we do it based on ladder? Do we do it based on views? Like how do we organize this data? Um, and especially in getting ready, there was time constraints as well. I mean, like we only had, I think it was two weeks maybe. So as far as dev was concerned, we only had X amount of time to prepare. So we had to focus on like very crucial parts of the tool to update. Um, and the, the Atlas bot actually had to be completely retuned. Um, the only thing that it knew how to do was take pictures from like the older level 85 to level 90 races. And the Atlas was going to change as far as the way it looked and the way it functioned. So it had to be completely rewritten and retrained. And I think Pert put like 15 hours in on it. <laughs> um, Jesus. And then curious. just organizing oh, the support crew to go alongside the casters was a huge endeavor too. Cause, um, like typically in the past, like we've had like a few people that would like watch for clips and make sure the casters got them, but we've never had dedicated support coverage like this before. Cause like not only would we need clippers, we'd also need like additional crew to act as scribes, like sort of taking notes so that the oncoming crew could at least know what the heck was going on. Cause they'd be sleeping or playing or whatever it is that they were doing. And so it was like an attempt to keep the whole production somewhat cohesive. Yeah. Mm. Question, Nikki, how long mm -hmm. did you know about it obviously because you're part of method you probably knew about it before everyone else did right um i mean <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot of it was uh i mean a lot of this this one specifically was like this is doing like we weren't like as method we weren't uh that involved like the other method players um we're getting so vero has stepped in now as a um uh, he's now our uh our link between method, like between players and the method as an organization. So that's going to change over time now. Like the player involvement with the actual method organization is going to like increase. So we didn't, I, I knew about it at after ExileCon, like right after, I think. That's, that's when. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just, I was just playing PoE. You know, nice. How how long did you guys expect the race to go? Were you surprised one way or the other by the um, like as racers since you were in the thick of it? Were you surprised one way or another by how long the kill took? Because it was what like a little no. more than a week or a little less? Like eight I online days, exactly. I think. Yeah, a little more than a week. Yeah, I was worried that it would be a little faster. I was hoping that would be a little longer. We were. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know that. I know the uh, cast was definitely. Uh... The initial cast was planned out yeah. like four days worth. Was, yeah, that was yeah. the thing like which that. was really weird about it. Because uh, so I came into this really late, like very last minute. I wasn't even going to cast at all, but they, I heard they needed the casters, and I'm like, I'm good at talking nonsense for eight hours. If anyone can like talk over mapping, <laughs> I could do that. Uh, so I got involved very, very last minute, and I was like, oh, like, what's the timeline? Like, yeah, three to five days. And I'm like, what? Everyone mm -hmm. I spoke to was like, nah, like, one to two weeks. And that's what I found really weird about it, is like, where did the three to five days number come from? Sorry, Brittle, you were going to say something? 
Um, I think it was just more or less like some miscommunications as far as management. Um, like I certainly went into it knowing that there was going to be, we're, we were going to need to at least slot um, seven days at the very least. Like if they finish prior, good. If it goes on later, then we have plenty of time to approach it because we have seven days booked. Um, but there is some um some issues with like getting some of that stuff off of the ground so the best that we could do was plan for three days and then go from there and luckily i mean Vera did an exceptional job managing the cast after i sort of like handed over the reins and like making sure that there was like the remaining casters like all got slotted in so that we could cover the entire one but we were running out of steam and resources and then someone and you know we got put out our misery by awakener actually dying before we had to uh, stop mm. casting. <laughs> that was actually really Put out clutch. Of your that was really, really clutch <laughs> because I was so I was mentally originally cast early and I cancelled, but then I was like, I'll start. I'll do it towards the end. So I can't. I casted the last two days leading up to it, and they asked me if I wanted to cast the Thursday, and they're like, just so you know, like we're not gonna cast past Thursday. So that's just it. We'll just have to work it out. And I was like, oh shit. So it's really clutch that Awakener died when it did. Because huh. yes. if it didn't, the cast would have just stopped. Because they'd have been like, right, okay, we've, we've run out. This is done. This is over now. <laughs> so no, uh, there had been speeches prepared yeah, yeah. for like the, how do we approach like telling everyone that this can't continue? Um, like, so we had like a wrap up speech planned. Like the thank you for your time and commitment had been like prepared and to go out to the various people involved to you. And I think the, the main thing to remember is that this was like a really limited budget. Like we did not have production uh, monies really. Um, all of our volunteers and our devs did it as volunteers. So the people that willingly, you know, like help us with the behind the scene crew and kept it going, they didn't, they didn't get anything. Um, like I eventually ended up like talking to Chris and they got some microtransactions and whatnot, but like they gave up their league start, which is potentially like some of the most valuable yeah. time to player just to help us that um, was actually why i brought you on um Riddle. so as far as i'm aware uh, noogie is in charge of all the checkbooks over at method so what? if you want to make your case <laughs> uh noogie's actually going to write a series of checks to everyone involved live on bay class i wish i wish i was in charge of that checkbook i'm on that but you know like nice. with all the the general restrictions that we had and whatnot i think we did a pretty bang up job no, you guys killed it. You did really well. Um, I agree. From uh, the racing point of view, from people who are actually like, involved in the race, uh, how was it for you guys? Like the format and just everything? The best. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't the best, because I'm not going to lie. The the uh, s cell phone group race that Method made like, had quite a bit of Negative community feedback, I think, was the most fun I've ever had in PoE altogether. But this, uh, the difficulty of the league, uh, the tactical dodges against the metamorphs, and just the general shift in uh, how you were making builds was so enjoyable for me. Because the 100 race, especially on SSF, it just kind of, over time, became this, like, make the most stupid build you can that just goes fast hope for the best and it's done and here it was a lot more thought out strategic and yeah it was it was incredibly enjoyable and uh i hope it stays like this hopefully for like a league or two and maybe it would continue because i was never a fan of like the boss kill stuff last time there was like a shaper boss kill i really wasn't interested until mm. it like uh, I might as well do it type of situation here <laughs> coming into it I was like I mean do you think really, a, really a, a similar competition next league would be as fun and exciting because people know Awakener now and you know the Congress that's it'll, the, like, the, you know the way it's it'll be very fast next league yeah like people will literally like and this is this was my fear with the Awakener fight, and I hope they're gonna make like an Uber version, like an actual Uber version of it, because that's that would be the only way to make it stand out. So the fear is that you just take out, like you take like a skeleton build. The only thing that's challenging is getting the stones, like, and then it's like yeah. just a blast to whoever gets there first, and then dodges some mechanics and doesn't fail. I I actually 
I, I wanted to hear you guys' thoughts on Awakener because it's been a controversial boss fight in the community. And yeah, for sure. I, after a few more attempts or a few more fights, some attempts, some successes over the last couple of weeks, like my opinion on it has, if anything, soured as I've okay. learned the fight more. In what way? Soured, yeah. So like... like it does kind of feel like the storms are a blanketed layer of artificial difficulty on top of an otherwise not incredibly um, complex boss. Thank you. I mean, I creating difficulty like, based on Congress, gates of RNG but... is not actually boss design. Well, the, the storms, would I, I don't know if I describe them as RNG. Um, how, how do you mean RNG? Because sometimes the storms don't follow you at all, and you can't kite them to like the appropriate corners, and then you get stuck with them on the stairs despite your best efforts and best execution of the boss mechanics. You can still get screwed because they're not behaving as intended. So, like, how do you know if you're going to go into the encounter and have a bug storm? How do you know if the, um, the like the, the wolf are... or the the maze are actually going to be there? But that's like the exception, no. Well, it's intended to be. If we're talking about bugs, it's something that eventually is going to get worked out. Yeah. Um, no, I think like the storms not following, they have a certain leash range, which is not extremely evident in the case of every single storm. Yeah. So I think it might be, yeah, sometimes the storms might be bugged. There's plenty of bugs with the fight. So it might be that sometimes the storms are bugged and just don't follow you when they should. But also it might be just like you're standing too far away, but you can't tell because it's there's no visual indicator that's easily noticeable. Um, and some of the storms move and some of them don't. Basically, like, a lot of the concepts in the fight are good concepts that need a little bit more polish and refinement in order to make the fight actually intuitive and enjoyable. I guess I when I when they said that there was going to be a focus on... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, like, when I... When they said that there's going to be a focus on boss design, I was expecting more comprehensive boss fights, not necessarily that the arena would be a big part of the boss. Like, I'm all for dynamic arenas. Like, we had Hydra before and um, some of those other ones. But I just, I, I, I guess I wanted more coming from the boss itself in the forms of, like, dodgeable abilities and, like, how do you interact with the boss to learn its damage pa patterns a la, like, almost Dark Souls-ish. I, I feel like they did a better job with that, though. In a way, because I feel like the conquerors are pretty self-explanatory. Like there was nothing. Oh, the conquerors are great. Yeah, I think the conquerors are great. I I enjoy all of those fights immensely. I just I just wonder if it was intended for them to do another like uber elder type of fight. I think they wanted this to be like accessible to people, but then for it to also not feel trivial. So like you can work towards awakener. With a much weaker build than what you needed to do for Uber Elder, I think. Mm. And the general difficulty yeah. doesn't come from the fight itself, but rather from the knowledge of the storms. So it's like, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think it's just a different idea that they had going into designing the fight itself. And then One eventually, thing, I oh, think sorry. they're going to build on it and make something Uber Elder ish like. Because Shaper was kind of the same way, except Shaper. Shipper was pretty fucking hard when it came out in terms mm -hmm. of just sheer numbers. Like, you needed a build that just needed to do a certain amount of damage because it sort of had an enrage mechanic, right? Yeah. Sort yes. of. So, so right. I think... You can really approach it with as many builds as you can with Awakener, I think. I think Awakener needs that, that Shaper had, that there is a soft enrage. I think that is what the cloud mechanic should have been. I think the fact that you can... Once you've placed them away, once you push them away, that they are out of the question is is bad. I, I mean, there sort of is an... the it's the more like storms, the circle things, right? They spawn randomly. Well, not exactly randomly. They spawn like next to you. So if you follow the pattern of the fight, they should spawn next to you, and they leave the burning ground. So the longer you take with the fight, technically, the less room you have to move around, but. I don't know. Then he like you mean the the, um, the Awakener's desolation puddles, the uh, the little ones that cut your regen. I mean the actual big clouds. I th I think they should have yes. been more of a creeping factor, like throughout the whole fight, that they can eventually just. 
I don't know, grow too far, too many, too much. Very I don't silly. Cause I don't personally have a problem with, because I know a lot of people have a problem with uh, an actual fail state that you can actually like fail the complete encounter and mess it up. As long as you are, as long as they provide information uh, that you can sort of um, engage, like you, you need to be able to figure it out on your own. You know, like, oh, I placed this over here. Okay. Okay. That caught me off for that much. Not just, oh, I went to the doorway and now it's over kind of deal. I think one thing... You know, you... when you look at Shaper and Uber Elder, you put the puddle in the middle and it's like, shit. Yeah, you made a mistake. That right. sucks. And I feel like the fight... But that doesn't, that, that doesn't make the fight impossible. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It just makes it much harder. Like, yes. placing the storm in the wrong spot can make the fight actually impossible. Impossible. Right. I think there's a few things which have kind of been touched on. So, like, as Ryan said, we don't know what their intention is. Like, we don't know if they're planning an Uber Awakener. We don't know if this is the first draft. Mm -hmm. Because there's a very big difference between Elder and Uber Elder. Like, Elder right. is a fairly yeah. simplistic fight once you learn the mechanics of it. And then it's just a case yeah. of, is your build uh, strong enough to do it? Um, I think the main issues, and again, I haven't done the fight because I've just been watching everyone else do it. And I've been not playing much recently with casting. Whatever. Anyway. I think the main thing is it's it's very clearly rushed. And I think the main way you can tell it's rushed is just from like a story point of view. They did a right. really good job like establishing this great new story and like all the different um conquerors, like you they taunt you, you build up a narrative with them, and then Sirius is just like, Yo, I'm here now, fight me and then out right. of nowhere he's like, I'm the big bad and then you kill him. Yeah, um, that's kinda weird. True, yeah. yeah. Also, yeah, one I thing agree. which I think is a really missed, uh, like, opportunity. His whole, like, iconography is he's, like, the destroyer of worlds. They have the armor set with, like, the floating rubble and stuff around him. A much cooler way of him destroying Oriath, instead of it just being a copy-pasted layout with some stuff on it, is if he actually destroyed the arena and it becomes inaccessible because, like, the earth shoots up, and then you've got, like, floating rubble and stuff. Ding. It would look way cooler, and I would much rather, a f like, a failed state, something like that, where the f arena is constantly shrinking, and that's your soft enrage, right. rather than there's a storm by the door, so now you can't enter, get fucked. Um, because yeah. it, there's nothing that exciting about a storm, but what would be really cool is if, as you're fighting the boss, you're literally seeing like the floor like thrown up in the air and you're like this is really intense i've got to kill him this and, is a dps check you know? i mean if they wanted to keep the mechanic of you having to kite the storm to a particular area and sort of customizing the arena that you get to fight in yourself they could have the storm instead of being an instant kill thing be something you kite over to a place and, and after a certain amount of time it detonates yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you have to kite it to a certain place within a time frame and yeah. then it'll detonate and destroy whatever yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think the reason why they designed it this way is because of longevity. I think because with power creep, right, Shaper, Elder, eventually Uber Elder became easier and easier. And it got to the point where people who were new to the game would get a build from forums, face tank the boss, and then go, this was a fucking joke. Well, yeah. here you can sort of do that with Awakener himself, but you have to pay attention to the storms. No matter what, you can't be a new guy yeah. stepping into there completely blindly. And it's maybe sort of an idea to prevent the whole like just throwing your body at him and you know, oh, I still have six portals. Like right. it's to prevent that. Cause you no matter how much power you're gonna have, well, most likely we won't be able to run through the storms once you fucked it up, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that was the idea. I'm not saying it's rewarding, I'm not saying it's good. But maybe that's what they were going for. I wonder if a, another design sort of like compromise as far as like creating a soft and rage too would be, I think, I think programming parts of the arena to actually be destroyed would be like pretty difficult, but as to like provide a soft and rage, maybe it'd be something more aligns like the storms slowly increase in size as the duration, then would... slowly like cutting off more and more of the arena leaving less place to kite the subsequent storms as well it would actually be very easy to program because they already have the tech from synthesis 
Bro, oh, they to like sort of remove the stairs. Come on, to shrink yeah, arenas because that was the whole point with synthesis. <laughs> that's the that's why I wanted to shrink arena. Just had, get rid of the stairs. You had <laughs> so the, the, uh, the blue forget it. juice returns in the form of uh, awaken or destruction. Mm. But yeah, like oh, it's something. Good. It's something like it wouldn't. It would actually be really easy because they already have the tech. So they would just bring in the synthesis walls, and then you just do a paint. So I'm not a game artist, but the way to describe this in a very easy way that everyone can relate to. Do you remember in Diablo 3 where you just had the painted backdrops and it looked very painterly? Um, and it, a lot of it was just like forced, like, oh, that's there. So you see it and they're literally just like slapping stuff on top. Um, or, for example, you know, in Reaper of Souls where you ride the ram and it like breaks the gate thing. And it looks like the ram is like flying back. It's like a battering ram. Like, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, Octavian didn't play the game. You fuck off, Octavian. Yeah. <laughs> the the battering ram. Um, you're literally on the top of a giant like siege machine, and it's like ramming like this. And you're like, Sounds oh, cool. the arena's moving. It, the arena's completely static. It's all just visual right, tricks. It creates, yeah. With mm -hmm. just a painted background. So all you would have mm -hmm. to do is use the synthesis tech where you've got something creeping in. And then you just animate some like swirling rocks in that creeping stuff, and it's like, oh, the ground is like crumbling up around you, and yeah. Um, God, dude, this just makes you want to. This makes me think of Lost Ark, and it's just mm. like, fuck. In that game, they so nailed all of that, and it's not like a trick. It's like the entire thing is designed around being just that epic and. I mean, we know they have this. Yeah. Chat's been like, that's easy because another game did it. They already do that in the current Path of Exile. And in Path of Exile 2, they have a town which is literally like a moving siege engine. Like, we have yeah. a giant cart moving. Like, this is tech they're currently implementing in the game, already exists in the game, yeah. and they keep going with it. Um, so this is all stuff they could do. And again, it's very clearly... I'm impressed that Metamorph is as good as it is because we had ExileCon. The fact they even managed to ship this league and it worked was very fucking impressive. But I think it's very clear that Awakener did suffer. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but like, you, okay. No, I feel like that. I, I, I have to be honest though. I, so, right, a lot of work and all that. I feel like that sentiment is a little bit problematic in its own. Mm. Mm -hmm. that we have to be like appreciative of things working it is but like it's I'm bullshit just, i'm it, sorry it, but i know um... i agree it's bullshit and it shouldn't be that reality but as we all know and we've all met well sorry but we other than brittle right. we've all met ggg devs and stuff yes. they are incredibly passionate they are set with limitations yes. because they have a three-month schedule they're stuck most other yes. companies would be like, we'll delay for a bit and we'll ship it when it's ready. They can't break their three month schedule. What? They're no. too committed to it. It would be the opposite. They would okay, not many. Early Some access, companies. You pay yeah. for this and you pay for that and then eventually <laughs> get it and it's a piece of crap and True. it has no content and it's been four years since the real release. I mean, like, I, I, certainly understand, I certainly understand the uh, sentiment here too because I feel like for uh, the past couple of leagues from like Synthesis on, there was sort of like this ask for forgiveness yeah. model yeah. that happened. Like they put out a league, there'd be these like, Pretty compelling problems with it they fix it and then it's sort of be like a, this is what we're working on we're going to fix it and there would be like this praise like oh this is such a good studio for fixing it and they were um yes. but it wasn't really until exile con and all the announcements came that we sort of had like the big picture because i was frustrated as a player because we were only getting like half of the story it's like why are these these sort of like glaring problems every single time should they reevaluate their their schedule as far as the 13 week lead cycle or what needs to happen because this isn't fun anymore. Um, but seeing ExileCon, seeing PoE2, seeing sort of like the scope, and then like, you know, I was hoping for a new end game with PoE2, the fact that we got it as like the very next expansion alongside of a, a league, I thought that was pretty darn cool. And like, it, it finally made sense why it was the way it was. And hopefully now that, you know, the cat's out of the bag, like, we can all move forward like we can sort of like re-establish those relationships between like the community and the like the developers and sort of like this narrative that it kind of become disjointed kind of can return and maybe moving forward that they like we understand what their limitations are they understand what their limitations are when they're also getting all this development done and hopefully that means 
you know, better leagues, less bugs. We'll see. Also, right. just to reply to a comment in chat, because this is a very common sentiment. Um, and we had, we've been getting it less this year, but we got it a lot last year. Maybe they shouldn't have released a brand new Endgame boss two weeks before Christmas because I was so, so close to quitting permanently but chose to reroll after seeing how bad Awaken is. The idea on paper, I agree. It seems silly to ship a massive product when you know that your staff are going to take time on leave. However, this is the busiest time of year. Always, if you're ever going to ship a product, you ship now because this makes you the most money right yeah fourth quarter is always you don't mm -hmm. skip this quarter this is like the yeah. dumbest thing you would ever skip also the gaming industry is notorious for abusing the fuck out of their workers and people on reddit people in twitch chat will be first to be like fuck bethesda fuck this company i hate how they treat their staff like shit you can't have it both ways you either say no i just care about the game Fuck the workers, right? Like, crunch is evil. Or you say, okay, I'm going to let the workers take some time off for Christmas. If it suffers a little bit, oh well. You can't have both, right? Um, it will get fixed eventually. It's really sad that we have to do this. All, as I agree completely, Nuki, it's really sad we always have to play this game of, like, it'll be good when it's good. Um... Like, Blight, I was very vocal through all of Blight. I was pissed off that Blight was just, like, dead in the water from the get-go, because I was like, the timing before ExileCon, there's no way they're going to get this working. Like, it's just it's yeah. just fucked. And that really pissed that me off. That whole thing felt really bad. Yeah, Blight was, like... Yeah. But do you see do you see this changing, though? Because if we... If, no, if the I, don't, I don't ever see this changing. This is, this is just an inevitability thing, right? of part so of Exile. Yes. Which, I don't... I think it's a side effect of their. I feel like it's it, it's still. I I do think that it's that we can we can expect. I don't know a little more. In some way, I don't think I I'm not gonna sit here and be happy with the current state all the time with allowing too many bugs because it can really like kill your like your full on the experience. Especially with boss fight, I feel like especially when they also like when we do have and obviously it's not like GDG plan and oh we're gonna have this like huge boss fight events where with streamers and everything and if there are problems i mean kudos for actually going through with it anyways you know with having some of these problems that might crop up though i i am a little sad still that it that like say like look at like say waggle coming in there and he just is he just disappears yeah that's not a good look yeah. And I yeah. really, I really want, I, I really want them to do better on that front. I really do. Like, or even, I mean, even earlier than that, we had the interactions with the four Watchstone Conquerors, where they right. would just stand there the entire time too. And like, here's yeah. this, like, the equivalent of like Phoenix or or Minotaur, and they're just standing there. Like, that's not fun either. Yeah. I mean, I had a, I, I couldn't. My watch, my watchtowers were actually unable to spawn at some point. A lot well. of people it's had just, that. That's, a lot of a lot of things, a lot of bugs kept cropping there, up. There, there, were, really, there were a really lot of really big bugs that it's... with the new system. However, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, because I know that you love mm -hmm. doing that, Nuggie. Yes. Would it have mattered if there wasn't this race? I think the mistake, if anything, was the race. Because if there wasn't a race, it would suck if some of the new oh. Atlas stuff was bugged. But it was only bugged for some people, and they fixed it within a couple of days. The, the race was obviously organized with ggg's blessing but wasn't really organized by ggg like yeah. the the financials were entirely zizaran yeah. and method and like the cast was entirely through method and all that as well like if like, if, yeah. if like ziz hadn't approached them there like there would have been an unofficial race because the community would be like who's the first person to get it right but there wouldn't have been all the attention on it right no the fact there was all right. this attention like for example when i was casting um golat had the thing where like his watchtower was just fucked and he was doing really yeah. well he was progressing he was just like i can't really do much more because my stuff is screwed what do i do now and I, I was like having to send a message to Chris, and I was like, "Hey, what's going on there?" And we interviewed him. And it was really frustrating. The waggle thing sucked, but if it yeah. wasn't a race format, then what would he have? What would have waggle done? What waggle probably gone? 
I know they're going to patch this because they even announced they were going to patch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said like days before, oh, we're going to try and have this patch by the end of the week, right? He would have been like, I'm playing in hardcore. Hardcore isn't what this game is designed around. I'll wait until the fix. For 99% of players in softcore, while it sucks to have a random death to a bug during a boss fight, it doesn't really matter because you're playing softcore and the game is designed around softcore. That only mm. matters in the context of a race with public attention with prize money in a hardcore setting if it was in a softcore race it wouldn't matter mm. sure you would have lost a couple of hours you have to um, get the boss to spawn again but it wouldn't have it wouldn't be a big deal i think if if the if the um if the question is oh do we do an event like this again if there's if a problem can arise i would say yes go for it like even even with the failure of uh you know some of the boss mechanics Right. I would rather have that we, you know, we give it a go still. Though hopefully hopefully they can improve on their you know on No, the, I, I uh, want them to like don't get me wrong, I want them to improve, yeah. but like do you get where I'm coming from? I think the oh, only yeah, reason it seems like such a big deal is because we're talking this from the point of view of people who casted yeah. and raced in a race, you know. No, I think you're right. Yeah, but like the thing is where does POE get advertised? Right? Where is like mm -hmm. the bulk of the people that see the game? I think it's primarily through YouTube content and there's, streaming. Like, there's yeah. not a lot of other advertisement from what I've seen that's going on other than, you know, esports journalism that they release mm -hmm. on leagues that's like deader and deader every time. So, I think something like this, if you're going to be launching an event such as this one, putting in that extra effort to make sure that something like this doesn't happen to the top player. It's, it's kind of important, man. Because I I'm kind of on the opposite. I'm 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 gonna take the boomer take where I disagree with a lot of this. Like I would much rather have a product that I struggle with every now and then, but have it release. It's just great content so frequently, and especially with conquerors, rather than be in like a Diablo three situation. Maybe that's oh, yeah. just like yeah. personally sure. me. Because, like, you know, obviously I play a lot more video games than probably a lot of other people can. So for me, this makes a lot more sense. So I kind of, like, take the bugs on the chin. But in the case of the waggle thing, god damn, I have not been that angry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, let's call it a spade a spade. $8,000 was lost because of a bug. Yeah, yeah. That potentially. Sucks. We won't know. Right, right, we don't do, but still. Yeah, very pretty, pretty yeah. certain that he would have gotten it. Yeah, but it I mean, it's it's it not the bad thing here is that there is uncertainty. It shouldn't have been. It should have been either or, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just I think it's okay that people can be upset about these things. I don't think we always have to either, you know. Oh no, pe say, people oh, are obviously just allowed to be upset. I'm just saying yeah. the reality is. It's just, it's one of, there's always going to be a bug. It doesn't matter what the product right. is, there's always going to be a bug. And right, it's never going to be 100% perfect. Yeah. And for the That's people, definitely something we have to accept. Yeah. For the people theory. saying, but what if they skipped a league? Yeah. Let's say, let's say theoretically they skipped an entire year. Like, let's just say they did that. And they've got current PoE. No, this, would, this is like just pure, it would never happen. Let's say they skipped an entire year of development. They got current Path of Exile, completely bug free, not a single issue whatsoever. As soon as they made new content again, bugs would happen because it's impossible to have a game without any bugs. So the idea of like, oh, let's just skip a league or let's just skip a thing. They would lose a bunch of money. And as soon as they started shipping new content again, bugs would happen. Bugs are inevitable with anything. Doesn't matter what it is. Sure. There will always be bugs. I think that the, the difference in the problem is that bugs are okay. Bugs are not okay when they're consistent in, to this degree. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. the thing that happened to Waggle could have unfortunately happened, but it's not that it, like, it's a one in a million situation. This was likely to happen. And yes. even the thing with Waggle is that Darky already was ready for the fight, and the reason why he wasn't doing it for, like, a day and a half was because... He, he was waiting for the fixes. Yeah. That That's it. He was just Same waiting for the fixes. Same thing with Lighty he, as well. He, he wasn't he even was playing. Ready to he, go. Was like, he said he was waiting for the bugs to be fixed. 
Yeah, yeah that's yeah. darky light yeah, the same. person. Yeah. So the, the the he was like he's he wasn't even playing at that point. It was a race that he was like sitting in standard because yeah. he was just like my best bet is to prepare on standard. It's better than actually playing since I'm ready to go. So it's like, if you have that expectancy for this, that's fucked up. I think, yeah. yeah. Bugs happen, unfortunate. But if it's across the board, that, that's not okay if you're putting out an event like this. Yeah. So what do you think they should have done? You think they should have turned down the event? If you were GGG and you were like, mm. guy, to be honest, like method... We would like to do it. It'd be great. It'd be great publicity, but the fight still needs a bit of work. No, we're not going to do it. I think you should have done it. If you were I Chris, more. if you were Chris, they're if, right. If it was the choice between this and like, I would have pulled pulled resources from other places to be able to do this. Again, mm. it's a very skewed perspective because to me, it's okay. like yeah, we don't know the distribution of their labor force. But, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know how much effort, if it's possible to even like take a person or two to primarily focus on this, take care of it, make sure that it's tested to, you know, at least a degree where maybe every second person has a bug and not every single person, right? Yeah. But uh, even if like Metamorph wasn't released, it was just Conquerors, I think people would still be happy, man, rather than kind of what ended up going down. Again, it is a very difficult question because we have no idea about the resources. I don't know if the same person that's responsible for fixing a bug with the Awakener fight or even testing is the same person that potentially is doing balance for Metamorph, which, you know, that person didn't seem present either. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I don't know that. I have no idea. But from my perspective, personally, even if Metamorph was pulled just for the sake of having the Awakener be a little bit more functional, I think it would have made sense. Um, from the point of view of the other Conquerors, um, so we don't just, like, sit on Awakener for ages, how mm -hmm. do you all feel about it? Personally, I like all of the, uh, Conqueror fights, aside from, uh, Drox, who's the War Banner dude. Yeah. That fight... Drox is. is it's a tedious is fight. Weird. And also, all the other fights, I think, are very readable the first time you do it. So the first time right. I did the Drox fight, I was like, oh, you've got to kill all the Banners, because the Banners make him immortal, not just the Banners he's in. And then we realized just now the charge thing and, like, Rai's taking the big fist. We only just clocked that now. So I think it's the least readable fight. I think it's got the worst arena. And it's just the, mo it's the most tedious. Like, I don't know. Fuck that fight. Yeah. Dra Drax is my favorite. Well, I don't I, like I, your Octavian because you left my lead. So it's fine. <laughs> What's your least favorite? No, Drax Octavian? is just my favorite. Drax, Drax is just my favorite from an aesthetic perspective. Yeah. Like, I, I think he's got some of the coolest attacks and voice lines and stuff. Um, I think probably the fight that mechanically I enjoy the most is maybe Baron. I like the, the mechanic of lighting up the squares, even if they should probably go away after you kill him, so you can get your loot without waiting for five seconds for the squares to despawn. It's a very minor gripe, though. Um, I do kind of feel like some of the fights I've got a skewed perspective on, because the ability with mines to prelay a ton of damage means that i i'm skipping a lot of the mechanics early on in a fight and i'm either like yeah. getting to the last 20 percent or just beating them um and also playing in softcore i get to invest a bunch more in damage so i'm doing that as well but yeah no i imagine once i swap over uh to you know a new league which i'm going to be doing in maybe like a month or so and i try doing the bosses with hardcore builds that aren't as stacked with damage, I'll probably have different opinions in some of them. I think the big... It's hard to discuss this because uh, a lot of people haven't played nearly as much as we have. And so I see comments very frequently that are like, Drox is easy, Viper guy's the hardest. When right. in reality, once you... You know, you click a poison immunity flask and you get like positive chaos, whereas the Viper guy does like literally, literally nothing. It, he's he's yeah. the four really one, easy fight. He looks cool, so I like him, but yeah, he's the easiest. Yeah. yeah. But like he absolutely does nothing. But when you're on like two, three watch stones and you're negative chaos resistance, it is insane. Like yeah. it is ridiculous. Right. Uh, That's fine. So like, that 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 progression for a lot of people isn't there. Where yeah, you eventually. Mm -hmm. I feel like Drox is by far the most fucked up one. Um, <laughs> not just, just because I like, go able to uh, 
Yeah. And Josh is consistently inconsistent. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, like, it's super it's easy. Like, like one, two, three, so easy. Four. Like right. Mm. Yeah. I I like that Al has mean is sort of a very specific kind of gear check, though. Because he's not, you know, awakener or he's not shaper. Like he's not the big bad at the end. So it's okay if you have one of these side bosses that you have to progress through to get to the big bad. It's okay if that side boss is very flavored, so to speak. Like, this is the chaos guy. You can specialize in being good against the chaos guy. If you get poison right. immunity and 30% positive chaos res, he's not very difficult anymore. I think that's fine. I just had the coolest fucking idea ever. Okay. Uber Awakener <laughs> summons the what do they call the projections, right? He summons the projections of the other conquerors throughout the fight. So during mm. the Awakener mechanics, you get the other mechanics, like, thrown in. So you're, like, you're doing Awakener, then all the snakes come and fuck you up for a oh, bit, yeah. and they go down, mm -hmm. and then the runes the giant start appearing, tornado. and he just cycles through them. That would be so fucking sick. I definitely want an arena with a puddle of poison and then also runes and then also the desolation from the awakener and then no, also no, he, storms no, not, like, all, not all at once but it's like as you're going <laughs> through the fight he just starts like doing multiple projections because he, he like... even says like the others became too dependent on their projections he's kind of like mm. fuck fuck them it's also, like I, stealing their I shit i like that oh. okay so i i think i've listened through all the lore i had a bug where zana wouldn't let me listen to some of the lore for some reason, yeah. like I just I, I was looking at other people's screens while while watching their streams, and like they had the option to listen to Zana's little blurb about Baron and who that is, and Zana's little blurb about Hasmin. I didn't get any of that. Zana wasn't interested in talking to me, so I don't know if I've heard all the lore, but I'm pretty sure when you reach Awakener is the first time you hear projections. It is, like yeah, it is. You're fighting these guys that are summoning magnified spiritual versions of themselves out of their chests. And nobody says shit. Nobody's like, yeah, that's a projection. That's yes, yeah, they're like dragging around like the, the body of their dependent person. That's the They've thing that I didn't JoJo get. Before. It's like, this is it's normal. like, is the projection them unleashed or have they been possessed by something? Is that a physical it's, embodiment it's... of their like mind? So my understanding of it is it's their like, so Inner they're all cells. very, um, yeah, they're all very like, specific character tropes yeah. and it's taking that trope it's taking that um characterization and just magnifying it so you know if you i did eventually get around to being able to hear some of the voice lines from zana about the other characters and if you talk to zana about drox she talks about how he was like magnificent on the battlefield and great at directing people and all that sort of thing and it's taking that and then twisting it and that's what becomes the progr the uh, projection so, so it's, it's sort of like kind um, of like their deepest desires personified and right. sort of but like, corrupted like... by the atlas so it's kind of like how comb and Doreso in act four it's like that's their like twisted nightmare version yeah. it's that but maps yeah actually that's a good comparison i think but yeah i i will admit the story started really good really good and i think we can all agree on that it started great like build your own map device was sick and then it just kind of like yeah there, there wasn't a lot of uh bridge between the beginning yeah. and the fight against the awakener like the... why is Siri so pissed what's up with that Where yeah he, like... okay, he crazy? So as far as i know so there's the five of them and they go to kill elder right um Cirrus is left to die to the Elder Death Explosion. So they, like, ditch him. Oh. The others all fuck off. And he's like, bruh, the fuck? And he's pissy, because they left him. And they all peace out. I think. Um, also, does, wait, wait, does Zana have the point? capability to summon a projection? Maybe that... Look, it's, okay, I think at some point we're that. killing Zana. And I'm gonna say that, and this is pure speculation, but this might be spoilers... When we were in New Zealand and we were at dinner with Nick, and Nick is the guy who writes the story, Rise on Table might remember this because they were sat next to me. I said, I'm. S this was also before uh, this stuff was announced. I said, I'm sick of Zana. She feels like this unofficial, like, mascot of PoE. Like, fuck this bitch. And Nick was kind of looking at me like, woohoo. <sighs> now, he could have been doing that because it's like, we're going to have this nah. whole new storyline centered all around Zana. 
But nah, fuck it. I reckon at some point we need to take her out. And maybe well, that could, sure. that could be like the Uber, Uber Awakener, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out Cirrus was actually the good guy and Zana's the bitch. And it's like, it's she's Zana's just projector. been manipulating us this whole time. I would I'm love just, that. projection Personally? is gonna be Einhard, her biggest desire. It's gonna be crazy, dude. <laughs> no, you know what would be good though? You know Romanceable good? options. No, you know what would be good though? Would be if Zana has been manipulating, right. It's kind of like, okay, spoilers for the latest Spider-Man film. <laughs> Basically, Zana is Mysterio, right? I haven't seen it, man. Well, it's your fault. Why? Meet the stream. It's fine. Meet the stream. I'm going to mute it's yeah, obvious from the beginning, though. Okay, so basically, <laughs> Zana is Mysterio. And the whole time that we're killing... How have you guys not seen the, the people saying spoiler? Why do I... I, I why do you need this analogy with a spoiler? <laughs> I don't understand. Basically, she's Mysterio, and we've been killing the exiles, and they're the good guys. And at the end of the Awaken fight, after you kill Cirrus, he's like, he does, he has an extra voice line. He breaks her like projections, and then it's like, oh shit, I killed the good dude, and then you've got to take down uh, Zana. Right, you can unmute now. This is the unmute wave. There you go. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, uh, I as far as the story goes, I don't know what the next step really could be because it feels like, you know, if they're gonna have stakes for what we're fighting for, there's just there's just not anything left to destroy. <laughs> like, I mean, we have to kill Zana eventually. I suppose. Because she's like, don't let her hear that, she, she's pretty uber powerful. Like, how do you know? They came up with like a giant beast out of their asses that was a mine and was bigger than the world and shit. I think they can come up with some new stuff. I yeah. don't know. It's, they, they're going to figure it out. But killing Xena would be appropriate. I do agree. Yeah. I mean, we also need to Nobody... keep in mind that they literally have all of Path of Exile 2 with brand new lore. So I think mm. they'll be okay to come up with some new story considering they've got a whole new story, you know. Well, there actually there is no continuation of PUE one in that way, right? No, there we're is, not getting PUE another like PUE two is set twenty years after the events of yeah, yeah, yeah. that's 1. what I'm yeah. saying. But until then, Conquerors is all we've got, lore wise, right? Like, there's not going to be another uh... thing. Oh where they're shit! Releasing... How the fuck does Conquerors work in Path of Exiles two? Because there's a time jump. That's one of the things that I've been curious about for some time is like there's this yeah. sort of promise that the campaigns would be side by side but then merge in in game. So how do you tie these yeah, two true. different storylines especially since like PUE2 is this sort of like revival of the classic like ARPG archetype of like killing just like monsters and then going for like slowly more powerful and powerful creatures and then we've got you know the PUE1 storyline which is basically like a 12 year old on his first D&D campaign playing god mode. I mean, we're killing gods, we're doing all these crazy things that are just, like, increasing, increasing in power. Um, so, like, how do we marry those two concepts in an endgame that is going to be cohesive and comprehensive to both? Well, I mean, they've already sort of abandoned Elder and Shaper, the storyline, and it's just, like, a thing that is in the game now that isn't tied around all this lore if you were a newer player so i think they That's would true. just do the same thing with this and they would maybe live as remnants in a way where people would go like oh yeah remember how 20 years ago there was that one guy throwing balls around in all yet they're yeah. gonna be like that but it, uh, past it i think it's going to continue as its own thing or yeah. and this maybe this would make more sense conquerors is exactly the same and the idea is as they've been in the map device for like 20 years and like they went the crazy over 20 years in the map. The fight against Awakener makes sense though. Yeah. Um, because the fight against Awakener isn't meant to take place in the map device. It's not that's, entirely... That's meant to be real world. I don't think it's entirely unrealistic either to expect another in-game at that point either. Because um, mm. I mean, if we think of the difference between 3.0 to where we are now, it's about two years. And I would say we're probably two years out from PUE2. I mean, like, we're supposed to get beta at the end of this, of 2020, you know, maybe released, like, third or fourth quarter, 2021. Mm -hmm. hmm. To um, get into the Metamorph thing, because we kind of, like, skipped around Metamorph, and we could talk endlessly about, like, where could this maybe go. Um, 
first impressions of Metamorph pre and post suction. What starting with you, Brittle? Suction. Oh yeah, the auto pickup of organs. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Actually, yeah. Oh, I had blocked out. Surprise! I realized I had blocked out the fact that you had to click on that. <laughs> that yeah. I had Same. honestly forgotten that. Yep. Because when it I just makes so before. much sense that you don't. Yes. There was no. Go on, Brittle. Pre it, it was just a bad dream. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm happy with how happy or I'm happy with how fast I prioritize that change because I mean I think even with the initial gameplay footage we all knew right there was nobody like nobody in the history of anyone was going to want to pick up all of those things all the time it was tedious I mean they had to have planned it right because like there was I do not believe there was a single person in the whole world who saw that trailer two or three days before the league with the metamorphs where the guy was picking up all the organs and didn't go, what in the fuck? Yeah. We have to pick up all of them? And there's like so one I every pack. Like, what the heck? Yeah. I think they already at that point, they were like, wait a minute. They knew. I mean, they must have been before that. They must have been like, this is the only way we can ship it right now. But eventually we're going to be fixing it. They 100% like the knew. I, I spoke to two different devs. I spoke to the guy who made that trailer and he because he wanted my opinion so he like straight after you post like hey what do you think of the trailer i'm like yeah that looks really cool but um you pick up a lot of shit and he's like yeah yeah <laughs> and he didn't really say anything more but he was kind of like mm, i can see why some people might think we have to pick up a lot of stuff uh <laughs> and, and then i spoke to a uh, regular nick he used to be known as cool nick but he prefers being called regular nick now i spoke to regular nick he's like hey what do you think of the new metamorph stuff I'm like yes it's cool, I really like it, but we're picking up a lot of stuff. And he's like, yeah, I didn't get to play it that much, but we were picking up a lot of stuff. So it seemed like everyone that I spoke to were all kind of like, yeah, there's a lot of... I can understand why some people might not enjoy this picking up stuff, you know? They're fucking doing the thing I told you about where they pretend like they don't know, but they knew all along, and they <laughs> come in, white knight, shining armor, and save the day with their oh. fucking patches. I'm telling you, dude, they knew from the beginning they had this planned out. Nah, Everybody's like, too, ooh, GGG listens conspiracy. to us. Honestly, no, no, they knew. Like, they fucking knew. And again, this goes back to Noogie's point earlier, where, like, if we have a leave without bugs, saying, yay, there weren't any bugs, is that should be the baseline, you know? Like, it, yeah. it doesn't feel good to say that. But that being the only biggest, like, the biggest problem with Metamorph, I'm cool with that. I'm very glad they got it fixed quickly, but yes, yeah, like I don't know. Compared to say Blight or even Legion, I, I think Metamorph has been implemented rather smoothly initially. It is fairly dangerous, true. but fairly. it's also it's just, fairly, just fairly dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's also like the kind of danger I'm okay with, you know. Maybe I saying am. that as playing softcore this league rather than hardcore means that my yeah. opinion is tempered somewhat, but like, no, oh. it's the kind of danger I'm okay with. You, my you list, opt into it. My list grows every day. Every day, people are like, dude, these metamorphs, they keep killing me. What do I do? And I'm just like, no volatile, no spirit, no barrage, <laughs> no, no powerful crits. <laughs> like, no, that, that's okay. Powerful crits, hex proof. Like, I'm okay with those. It's just the, yeah, the volatile, barrage, spirit, anything esoteric, just fucking stay away. It's it's always ridiculous. But that's cool. Not. I like that. I, I like that yeah. too. I eventually won't like it once I like, die to it, and I'm going to be yeah. like, this is some goddamn bullshit. It's but supposed to be right able now, to fucking I really kill like you. It. Yeah. yeah. But I, okay, they need to up the visual clarity. Yeah. I can say that about literally Agreed. fucking any part of Path of Exile, though, almost. Like, that. Yeah. that is baseline truth of path of exile in its current state and it's really hard to do because like people are going to take a skill like toxic rain and they're going to add seven projectiles to it and turn it into a mind skill and they're going to cover their whole screen with flowers and what do you do as a dev like what do you do as a dev in, in order to combat that like that flowers the mtx do you just like not let people it's do that no the mtx design around oh toxic rain i thought you said yeah, toxic yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Costa Car is tentacles. Information, but like, Firestorm, whatever, like everything, every every PUE build ends up, well, a lot of PUE build ends up being yeah, just unless a you're playing like dual mess. strike. So you need to design around the fact that your game is a visual mess and just accept that fact. 
It's but, just but they can in metamorph, for instance, try and let have it, uh, lighten that load by yeah, make most of the metamorph stuff gooey black soup. But then the really dangerous things have those stand out. Like maybe the gooey black soup has a blinking red thing in the middle of it that's like burrowing under the ground towards Wait, you. Wait, you're and saying that's the, the, really the gooey thing. black soup should have a blinking slightly blacker soup? Yes, I agree. Yeah, oh, that. exactly. Yes. <laughs> like the, the, the scarabs that burrow towards you and then explode in spikes, those could have glowing red hearts in the center of them Underneath or something. Underneath black like you soup, yes. That yeah. Was... Okay. Sure. I love the scares. That was the first thing I like, learned because they like. I don't shit. think you have to. I don't think you have to compromise on the visual integrity of the theme of the mechanic, mm -hmm. in order to make it more enjoyable to interact with. Like those don't need to be at odds with one another. I'll say this though: the more I play with Metamorph, the less I feel like we need to have full clarity. Because once you start understanding the mods and you read them and you know which things kind of come together, which are dangerous, you know what to look for, the fights change a lot mm. in terms of how you engage with them. And they don't feel as bullshit because you're opting into it. I personally think that, I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing meta, like all the 16 metamorphs, basically. And I'm like very meticulous with which ones I pick. And it's... I don't know, it's really enjoyable. That's sort of been like my favorite part of all this too, is that there's all these new mechanics that have been introduced that are going to be like metamorph specific. And they're a lot of them are rippy, you know, there's all these new interactions as far as like the projectile spam and the spiders and some of the other detonations and whatnot that are hard lessons to learn, but I, I enjoy that. I'm glad that there's new things here. I think one of the the ways that metaphor um unfortunately is like been really unpopular is because they've tried to solve some of the scaling issues by simple percent modifiers and unfortunately there's like a huge gap that gets created when you just increase life on things um it creates a huge division between builds as far as what certain yeah. builds can do that are meta versus others that aren't um which you see more in it's maps a... than anything else because the metamorphs in maps are far scarier than the ones in the laboratory because of map modifiers that's my biggest issue with the league is the lab fights are fucking meaningless it's just a late delete. Yeah. I've never been frightened by one. I think that's the that's, real shortcoming. That's sort of, of the, the problem with like trying to create difficulty, though, by just adding more health, yeah. unfortunately. Well, the thing is, too, that in the lab, you're familiar with the attacks. You know, like, mm. what Brutus is going to do. Well, actually, he has a pretty feisty one. The flying drop kick, nuke yeah. bomb. <laughs> <laughs> that one's, you can, uh, but you know that it can across happen. The screen. Yeah, like, the, <laughs> you know, you kind of have an idea, but like what fucking soul eruption is or the spidey crawler guys. I'm so happy about the crawler boys. It was so cool. I got hit by that on my very first map and I almost died. And I was like, whoa, okay, never doing this one again. And then 10 minutes later, Ziz died to it. I'm just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my build did not die to that. <laughs> it was good. Would you like I them to the buff the lab? Because I would. Sure. <sighs> It's more like, like how would you would balance go. it though? Would you yeah. buff the lab and then like reduce the modifiers in the maps? Because they can't do anything about map modifiers. I would probably I map, would have it so problem. like it brings some of the map modifiers into it. So the, the things that really make them dangerous is the is the actual modifiers on the different organs you put in or the different units. Because the they will have like yeah, the rare mobs. They'll have like a couple mods in there. They'll like spawn with fists. Like you'll have the boss itself have like an aura so, on as well. That's um, what makes it crazy because yeah. you have like these. It'll it'll two Sub three times the damage compared <laughs> to the lab, and not from the map mod itself, but just from like putting in the rares and not the boss. The bosses are actually the easiest ones because they never really come with extra damage modifiers. So um, I want to see Tane have more involvement in the process in the laboratory rather than just like standing up there and then saying congratulations you didn't die <laughs> after you beat it. so you could have a um device modifier similar to zana's map device modifiers where you can pay in i don't know catalysts maybe to have you know things like substantial extra fizz or powerful crits or Ooh. hex proof or things like that added to your lab beast and get extra rewards as a result so if you want a more powerful lab beast 
give him an abrasive catalyst and an intrinsic catalyst, and suddenly your lab beast has twice as much uh, fizz damage and powerful crits. And if you beat it, you get extra loot. Yeah, but then do you increase the size of the arena? I, I, I don't think know. I, I think I prefer I the problem with that is catalyst <laughs> catalyst of two See, but then no, you have just a problem with die. himself. I'm surprised by that because his whole thing is like, I don't like anybody. You fucked me over, exile guy. I want you dead. Fight this lab thing. I thought you would like that. No, that's not why he wants you to fight the lab thing. No, he's he was what? talking about how you like imprisoned him yeah, and that's shit, not and you. now he's free. That's not you. He's talking. No, he's like, talking dad. to his. Yeah, he's so the the what you're doing in the lab is you're taking the samples from map bosses yes. and you're combining them with the master sample that Tane has. And in yes. case you haven't looked at the lore, spoilers, no. that master sample is is extracted from his dead pseudo father, yeah. who Ooh, isn't nice. actually his real father, but is an Oriathan who enslaved Captain him. As a slave, yeah. Oh, and he's like abused that guy. him. Yeah. So he's when you load into the lab yeah. and Tane's like, I hate you, you ruined my life i'm going to keep you as a slave forever he's talking to the jar of goop that his dad used to be. <laughs> yep. i thought he was pissed at me dude no he's not talking to you he's talking i heard him to say jar. some real nasty shit oh, okay. see the problem, um, the problem is so, his rise is and so that's used why to he's... talking to me that he just was getting like flashbacks <laughs> and he went to the lab he's like oh yeah yeah this is talking i get this yeah that's about me yeah. that's why that's why you're doing all this in the first place he's trying right. to I mean, partially, he's trying to punish his father. Like, he's got his father's soul locked in a jar, and he keeps forcing it into reanimation, and then you keep killing it. Like, Tani is real fucked up. He's trying to figure out, like, why this guy was so bad to him. Like, understand why what happened to him happened to him, and, like, why people behave that way. That is, I think, a pretense. Like, that's what he says he's doing. I think he's just torturing his, his dad, who tortured him as a kid, honestly. And like he's coming up with a justification for it. Fuck. Hey, I'm sorry. Like delving into the psyche behind this character, I I think he's just screwy. What the fuck? Yeah, just ignore Twitch chat. It's, <laughs> uh, it's put, yeah, subscribe already made on Cheers, mate. There you go. Yeah, nice. Oh, that's a lot of nice cocks. <laughs> oh, oh I didn't have Twitch good. chat open. Thanks for Damn. bringing me up to speed. Damn. It's the play button. Um, it's good. Clear anyways. Channel. Yeah. Private yeah. DM of that. God damn. Um I think this is another example though of kind of like what we had with Blight where all the dialogue was leading somewhere and then we didn't get where it was leading to. I think it was very clear that with Metamorph it was a case of we made this whole thing in two weeks. And I think Metamorph is a great lead considering they made it in like two weeks. But I, I do think Tane's a lot better fleshed out than than Cashew. Was. She he's, is, he doesn't but the, the league mechanic outside of maps isn't at all. I suppose. Because, yeah. like, no, think about it. Like, he's got all this flavor, he's got all this lore behind him. But what do you actually do? You go to his lab, you make a boss, the boss is a joke because it hasn't got any mods, as we discussed, and then nothing happens. And then you just keep <laughs> doing that over and over and over and over. Like, there's no real payoff to it. They should mm, let you count the boss. Noogie looks like you disagree. I mean, payoff in what in what sense? I'm trying. I'm just trying to understand your sentiment. There's okay. So you collect all of these organs. The right. organs currently have different weightings. So just collecting the right amount of organs can be a struggle sometimes, right? So you collect all the organs. Right. You then go and kill a very easy boss, and right. you get loot. The loot is your reward. How they're from yes. a narrative point of view, and they keep trying to build these narrative leagues. There's no narrative sure. payoff, and it's very anticlimactic because of how easy okay. the boss is. So it's no, not I like would, I would agree on that. it's not like if you're delving and you kill a really hard all, you're like, oh, that felt good. I killed a really hard all. With this, right. it's a you're just delaying right. a loot explosion, and the it's the loot explosion is easy. It's just you're clicking a chest. Mm, yes. There's, there's I think no that's my only the league is yeah. the there's no there's no fulfillment at the end there's no yeah. closure yeah conclusion Filling, or anything though you could say that that is a narrative device in its own right because there's never going to be any closure for Tane. <laughs> oh god that's too real <laughs> no i appreciate you wrapping your bullshit up so neatly in a in a bow but no yeah <laughs> it, was, it was packaged quite nicely yeah. 
That reminded me when I, I was in think, art um... school and I had to like write essays and give presentations on why my <laughs> film was a bit scuffed. You see, the reason why some of those edits looked a bit rushed wasn't because I wasn't doing my work. It was because I was actually trying to make a bigger narrative picture uh, on my subject. You know, no, fuck off. Um, yeah. I don't know. The delayed loot explosion. I, I don't know if I hated that much, honestly. I, I don't... What What is the actual, like, problem with it? You fight a pretty dangerous but... metamorph. All the good aspects but of it are not there. And then the eventually lab. you just if, get your stuff. If the lab metamorphs were as dangerous as the one you fought in maps, maybe slightly harder, I would be into it. It just... Right, because like in in the maps you can kite to a certain degree too. Like if yeah. you get in trouble, you have more room. But it's almost like yeah. Easter Egg 2.0, where you're like shoved in a basically a closet with this just monster that you created. I mean, there's definitely like room for it to be far more difficult than it is. It also doesn't make sense. It's like, oh, we're killing these really scary metamorphs. We've made these bosses, and then we're collecting the essence of this really scary thing we made. So you should be building something even scarier. Instead, you take mm. the essence and you build something weaker. And yeah, but that's see, but she said you shove him in a closet, right? His goopy dad, and then also it's gonna be in the closet. The exactly one and two, all of them have a part of goopy dad, and goopy dad sucked, so they're weaker yeah. now. And it, it's Tana like beating him up over and over, so he take has that, to be goop dad. Take that. There you go. I just don't, like, outside of the lore elements, I guess. I really, I don't know. It would be cool, don't get me wrong. The more scary shit, the better. But then I do feel like they have to increase the arena or, like, they yeah. would have to do a lot more with it than just it, than just it, this. Because, yeah, being in such a closed in area, it's just too specific to builds. And then if it's really powerful, it would be, like, okay, melee league question, low. question, then. If they took the rewards out of lab, and they made the metamorphs you fight slightly more rewarding, and they got rid of the lab completely, would it be a better mechanic? I think it would. I think it would be mm. worse for the average player. I think the average player enjoys that really shit. Did. Yeah, I think uh, definitely the more casual players are going to be dependent on the on the lab for generating currency for Yeah, themselves. no, I'm saying if they took that reward and added it to the fights. Because the average player still has to kill the scary metamorph to well, get the lose. organ to go to the lab. As, I don't as think much the as lab like adds even anything. with our, as much as like even with our overlay memeing about how there's no eyeballs, you know, each of us has an organ here. There's there's no eyeballs on screen. That was the joke. In case you didn't get that, um, thank you. What you would lose is the hunt for eyeballs, yeah. which admittedly at the start of the league was a bit fucked because they had the balancing all wrong. But I don't think it's a bad concept. Like I think having an organ that's rarer than the others that you're hunting for and you're excited when you see it. That's good. Like they have the balance pretty okay now. Eyeballs, particularly if you do strats with multi boss maps to try and farm them, aren't yeah. that insanely rare, but they're nice and rewarding when you see one. And I think losing that would actually kind of be a bad thing. You lose that extra layer of meta. I'd rather yeah, see them improve on the laboratory than cut it out. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree as well, but I just think that in its current state, if they if they weren't to improve anything, I think it'd be a better mechanic without it. I don't think so. Oh. I think there's then they would just feel even shallower. I think there's a desire for almost like the the super super goop dead, almost like if you're gonna build and then collect yeah, parts the and then collect parts from the builded parts, then super goop dead should have been more difficult and more rewarding. What does the bar do? Nothing at the moment, as far as I can tell. No, what right? the what the, the bar what? does is it increases the chance of additional rewards, and that's how you get the metamorph uniques. Okay, does filling it give you an additional each each like if you read what it does each like bar yeah, no the stats on the side i understand those they give a more multiplier to you know life and quant and rarity and yeah it just, it just makes it drop better rewards, but yeah. like filling it doesn't filling do anything it doesn't special do anything over reaching 95 percent yeah like the difference between 95 percent and filled is still just a slightly higher number it's yeah. not like a threshold that you're reaching um maybe there was a super goop dead that just never got implemented hmm. that honestly i think they're might have been something along those lines. Yeah, no, I, I think you know, that, I think that definitely was. Especially because if you go to talk to Tane after you do one, his voice line that he has for you points towards that being the case, where he says, like, oh, well, this time it didn't work out. That's disappointing. Maybe next time. But it's an eternal maybe next time because there isn't actually a thing to achieve. Find out where the breach mobs are coming from. Discover the secret language of the Harbingers. Who is behind mm -hmm. the memories of Synthesis? 
what's the big blight? Well, like, well, this, this, this is exactly my point. We did figure point, out though. who is behind the memories of Synthesis. Like, lore-wise, yeah, we did figure sure. that one out. But, but this yeah. is exactly but, my yeah. point, and I just want to stress this, because both Rise and Nugi disagreed with this, but an hour ago, you were saying that it'd be better to scrap content to better improve the polish of the Awakener fight. This is the thing which annoys me about GGG. I'm okay with there being bugs, but what annoys me is the fact that there isn't someone in the office who's saying, okay, you have all of this scope, let's rein the scope in. Because I think it's much better that you instead make more succinct leagues, which may have less going on, but they are a more complete experience. Then you have these open-ended leagues, and then you're designing more content, which leads to more bugs. So, for example, with Blight, we had this whole thing of like, oh, is the Blight maybe going somewhere? And then it didn't, and that was a disappointment. And then we had the same thing with this, where it's like, oh, what's this leading towards? Oh, not really anything. I guess it's another layer of complexity, but it doesn't lead to anything. So it feels like a disappointment. Mm -hmm. If they trimmed I... that back, there'd be less stuff they'd have to design, meaning they'd have more time to polish. Currently, they're not doing a... anything. I think Metamorph is maybe a good step in that direction, though, because like... If you look at the scope of the story, it isn't as vast and crazy as something like Abyss or Breach, where, you know, suddenly, all over the landscape, portals to an alternate hell dimension are popping up. Like, that's a bit more impactful of a, of a narrative thread than, you know, I've got my dad in a jar and I just really don't like him and want to keep combining him with beasts. Like, the scope of who's impacted <laughs> by these stories is a lot smaller. Hell dimension beasts popping through random portals from from beneath the ground is going to impact all of Rayclast in theory. It's like Whereas a side quest. What Kane is doing is it's yeah, no, it's like a side again. quest. It's it's like it it impacts Tane. Yeah, but like it's really important to him and his lab and all that. But like you could see it just not really mattering to most people. But also, mm -hmm. it's it's one of those things by having tighter narratives then that means that guys in charge of narrative, uh, like Story Nick, they have to write less stuff. It means less voice lines have to be recorded. So that would mean with something like Cassia, if they cut all that random dialogue that went nowhere, then he would be able to write more than three lines in a song and they could have recorded more than three lines. So when you encountered Cassia, she wasn't always saying the exact same thing over and over and over and over again constantly. But that's like, her thing though. It's so annoying. Uh, it, that's kind of the point. I hate it, but that's kind of the point, and that's why people like it. But like the thing is, too, that what you talked about, um, just to address it, I guess Poe's gotten to me like to a point for me where, as much as I love death and difficulty and all this stuff, and having like a main storyline progression, to have side quests that are satisfying with a reasonable degree of difficulty is good hmm. like the lab isn't exactly the most terrifying thing uh the laboratory right you, you just kind of go in there and you go for loot but because it's such a closed in area and you know specifically what you're going there for with a chance of potentially getting that unique item it is very satisfying and i feel like delve is that for a lot of people as well because many people just kind of don't always keep going down they get to a certain level where they feel comfortable, meaning that they most likely won't die. And every time they've got Delve set up, they're like, ooh, it's time to get some good shit. This is going to feel good. I'm going to get rewards. And it's not particularly difficult. And yet rewarding with that slight occasional chance of, of death on top of it. So I feel like they do a good job with that. And Lab is a part of that. And I just hope that somewhere in the world there's a guy right now who has died to the lab a trillion times and he's just angry as fuck about how we're talking that it's easy. Mm. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't like it removed. <laughs> just okay. just to, to close that up. Um, just to talk about the meta stuff we finish up, just talk about Atlas because we've been going on for quite a while now already. Um, how are we enjoying the rework in terms of skills? Like bow meta, by the way. How are we feeling about the current uh, skills this little patch? <laughs> Uh, I agree with all of the changes that were done, and I think they should have done more. Like, I think it's evident in the distribution of classes and ascendancies that there should have been more done. Yes. As far as if the if the goal was overall balance, they balance some things, but like not I everything. don't think any. I don't think 
probably 90% plus of the changes that they made were bad changes, but they, it's, it's what they left out more than what they actually did that I disagree with as far as the patch is concerned with skill changes and, and reworks and that kind of thing. Wait, you said 90% of the changes were bad changes? No, good. Okay, yeah, because I, I heard bad. You I'm had like, the percentage what? backwards. Or yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I feel like this was kind of them uh, trying out the waters, and I think they're waiting for a big community response uh, because this was the first really patch where it was just like, you're reading it, and no matter where you're coming from, you're getting nerfed. And yeah. not only that, Shit's getting harder too. And right. you really feel it. And the game is very different. The whole game overall, leveling, mapping, end game is very different than, yeah. at least to me, than what the game felt like the previous patch. And I think if the response is going to be positive, they're going to be more aggressive about it in the future. Hopefully with things like summoners, because I think yeah. that's the main issue to address for me right now. I think everything else is in a pretty good spot. Obviously, there's going to be imbalances. Obviously, if you're like a big uh, melee guy, you still have to put in more money and effort into making a character work. Same for bows. <laughs> but uh, I think the the summoner thing is really didn't one of trumpling the top 15 a lot of the effort awakening kills in. go to a five link class rate. Top fifteen. Yeah. Five link class rate. Yeah. Yeah, there's it's a like last a, rate. number five or something. I think it, it was, was like a five link rate. melee. I didn't know the skill. Mm -hmm. Glad it was a glad, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like a glad would be pretty good for that fight. Yeah, blood is really weird. good. It's so weird how they made it so like that entire fight so easy around block. I really don't get it. It's like block just makes it so much easier. Max block gladiator with like aspect of the crab would probably mm -hmm. be really good for awakening because the don't, mitigation don't from crab would be very good against the fizz D gens, yeah. and then you block everything else. Likewise, a raider using mist wall with aspect of the crab would be absolutely insane for that fight. I'm surprised we haven't seen more raider mist wall builds. If you don't know, mist wall is the new shield that gives you max block every four seconds if you haven't blocked recently. So you make a dodge evasion based character and then you stack like Kintsugi, Wind Dance, all of this stuff in your character. Yeah, it's great with those. You dodge everything, you evade everything. Oh no, something got through my dodge evasion block. I'm just like... What was the original topic? I think going back to you, uh, sorry, <laughs> sort of talking right. about like the, right. the balance and the meta and everything like that. I think um, this has sort of been like a long time coming. Um, I started playing about two years ago in Harbinger. That was my first league. And consecutive with every single league, they've sort of like made more and more dangerous creatures and mobs, like every single subsequent thing that they've introduced. Like I remember being pissed about abyss mobs and then they're like, Oh wait, there's more in, in the form of like all of the chaos craziness that we got out of incursion and then sort of like followed by Legion with all the different Legion mobs and like the red wall and all the controversy with that. I mean, like, I feel like over time that this has been sort of like what they were wanting to gear to and achieve. But, like, we all kind of knew that, like, a big squish was coming. There was going to have to be something where fundamentally everybody's power level got taken sort of, like, down a couple of notches in order to restore the difficulty in the game. Because you talk, like, to people that were around when Shaper was introduced and how hard it was to get the damage in order to fight him. And then, you know, like, the state of Ever Elder prior to this patch, where someone could start a league, play PoE for the first time, and roll up on Ever Elder and kill him. I think we all agree that summoners are kind of dumb right now. I'm just curious, since I think we, we all like that it's getting harder, right? Like, no one doesn't like that it's getting harder. Yes. Right. Of the current, like, top builds, what do you think is, like, an acceptable level of power? Like, we think summoners too much, we should bring that down. But where do you kind of think that it starts to be okay? Like, is the current state of miners too much as well? A bit. I think they have too much access to damage. It gets too, like, it's... The right side of the tree, damage wise, if you go on mine, it's like ridiculous how much utility and damage they get. See, but so I, I, I kind of like uh, that in a way it's because it's, fun. it's it's a trade off. It's that skill tree trade off that I really enjoy where you can totally right. do that, but most likely you're going to be missing out on defenses, right? It right. doesn't make for a very yeah. well rounded character unless you like truly invest into it. So Slightly. to me, miners would be it. Yeah, actually. Yeah. 
I would kind of say the same because especially it's it's one of those things that miners while well, they do do ridiculous damage especially talking from a hardcore view they're very squishy until you get them f fairly fully geared so yeah. they they have that it, like it changes where the investment is yeah exactly yeah, and the main survivability like region node that got you know whacked a couple of leagues ago too um other so so other than miners, I feel like I'm miners just... are where I think miners is where you start where the outlier should start. Yeah, okay. To be where you feel like oh maybe but not quite. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I think that's like the where you could you could you could reasonably nerf some of it maybe or not and it would be like that's the outlier. I think that's yeah. the level. I mean, I think they've always sort of had the glass cannon archetype in PUE. Yeah. What do you think damage wise? Like where where would that be? Is like essence drain, for instance. Like that shit doesn't do a lot of damage, or like vortex nowadays. Right now. yeah. yeah, it's kind of it's kind of rough. That wouldn't be enough, right? Yeah. Like what in in the mills? I feel like six, seven, eight hundred mil, where it's like somewhat consistent damage, or not mil a uh, thousand, yeah. is like kind of reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now for for a build. Yeah. I do think that it's important that they come in and actually kind of decide on a level across the board. I know I, I'm not a big fan of normalizing, but there has to be <sighs> no. But just follow me here, because once you have, once you have once you have like the summoner outliers, it really just puts a kind of a stain on everything else. You feel really like that you're making mistakes or that either. I don't know, you feel dumb for not doing it, almost. I think right. our perspective is being skewed somewhat by the fact that we're two weeks into the league, though. You know, now we're starting to see some of, against the new content, some of the builds crop up that do take that level of extra investment, but can push much further as far as the top end goes. You know, like, there's that clip that was making the rounds a couple days ago of the explosive arrow build against Awakener that took him from half health down to nothing in, like, a couple seconds. You know, these these builds that require that upper end investment are now going to start coming to the forefront. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some crazy impale blade flurry champion just absolutely demolish Awakener over the next week or something like that. Like Summoner isn't the ceiling. No. It's just the so easiest not ceiling to reach. I'm not talking about ceiling here at all. I am talking I do I don't think it's healthy to have these like super I think it's fine that we can have the, you know the lower investment bills that work but there's like a limit to like how much power if you barely power, you have, yeah. i mean what level yeah. was that by being so three million damage with literally with no no investment into gear it's just not it's when we're then talking about ed struggling to get 800k no i, you know, I agree like with tripling you in damage in is, is a bit of a problem like wasn't not dan like level 80 on a recently. fresh like tabula six link or something when he did the awaken a fight yeah. yeah. I mean, Havoc did summon Skelly's Jug, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is just kind of silly. I mean, it gets back to like the Hoag argument too. It's like if you can have all of this like stacking damage that's really powerful, and I mean, skeletons have always been exceptional mm. single target. Um, but that it's completely independent to you too, which gives you safety in the arena, and you can build around the defenses because there's a lot of access to minion multipliers beyond just the passive tree too. And so it goes back to almost like that Hoag argument of like you can build the toughest character ever and you throw like a little bit into some minion damage and then there you go, you've got a bossing build. Yeah, ag agony perplexes me still. I don't understand how it's gotten through so many patches and still intact in the way that it is. Yeah, but it is weird. Whatever. It's it's not a meta shifting build for the majority of the player base, so I believe that might be why it's fairly low down the po yeah. totem pole of prioritization. Yeah, pretty much. Um, before we finish up, I would like to talk about Atlas since we didn't really talk about the Atlas, and that's changed fairly substantially. Um, specifically from Rise and Nigi's point of view, because you had to like learn it under extreme pressure. What do you think of the new Atlas progression system compared to the old? I think, okay, there's definitely some problems with it from, like, uh, a long-term point of view. Yeah. But short-term, I feel like they accomplished everything that they wanted to in the way that they got rid of 
literally all of the problems with the old Atlas, right? So like the whole speech that they were giving with like no more bullshit circles and this stuff, I feel like that really limited them and they got rid of that. There's no longer a situation where if you're a level 70 guy and you just got into maps and you know you want to run red maps, you can. You can progress exactly to that. And there's definitely a lot of learning right now. A lot of people have the mentality of, and I know I was one of those guys where it was like, oh, let me complete all of my white maps. And then I'm like level 85 and I just go, oh, I'm like halfway done. And I kind of don't want to run white maps anymore. And mm -hmm. then you start understanding the watchstones and you're like, oh, this is, you're supposed to play the exact opposite of what this is now. The strength of your character is going to dictate the progression of your atlas. And I think that makes a lot of sense because maps also seem to drop a lot more frequently, like like a lot more. Mm -hmm. And the way that people previously were talking about how like sustaining a single map is not possible because you uh, simply don't drop enough and you can't do the whole shape strategy. I see people sustain single maps with a properly laid out atlas due to the sheer amount of shit that drops. Mm. So that isn't entirely gone either. And so I like it. But it, it requires a completely different mentality than you had previously. But with more freedom, at least to me. The only thing I don't like is maybe how on top of the randomization of the actual map drops, which isn't nearly as important, the randomization of how long it takes to get a fucking conqueror spawn. Mm. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> my only... Like, sometimes it is like you run 50 maps. Yeah. And really? No influence. Yeah. And it's I've just... Never had I mean, there's, there's a lot of inconsistencies here. So yeah. a lot of people will have different experiences. People are talking about like 50 to 100 maps and nothing is spawning. Other people are like, oh... I, I'm like five, ten minutes. All the time, yeah. The yeah, yeah. Because that's my experience. Whenever I've reset the thing, I start running maps again. It's like five to ten, it spawns like every single time. <sighs> Once uh, I got to like 20, holy shit. <laughs> it was crazy to me. Right. I was like, I, um... It is not. I dedicated a full day, 16 hours of grinding maps. And granted, mm. my build wasn't the fastest. Then I got three influences done the whole day wow, oh, wow. it was like, like nothing to wow okay. yeah my, um, my least favorite thing with the new system is something that's relatively small but has a much larger impact than i initially thought it would being unable to sextant influenced zones because oh. part of the annoyance of having to run a larger variety of maps is that you don't get consistently nice density in all of your maps. Like sometimes maybe you have to run Strand because that's right. the map that you have left in that zone that would proc your influence for you. And that can be equalized through sextant use. If you put sextants into your zone, then suddenly every map feels at least all right because you've got a decent amount of monsters in all of them. And then the influence comes in and you can't do that anymore and I'm stuck running maps that I don't like so I can proc influence that don't have very good mob counts in them and I can't fix it with the material that I have in my stash that I could use to fix it, but I'm not allowed to use it for arbitrary reasons. The reasons are not arbitrary, though. It is because you spawn extra mobs. And this is true. in lower tiers, you can guarantee that. And on top of it, you have a free hideout that you can run without actually having to remove the influence. Free so you spawn hideout. the Conqueror map. Uh, yeah, like when you discover where the hideout of the Conqueror hmm. is, you can spawn it, you can roll, run though. it. What's up? It's, not very, it's not a very high value it's map. It's not very high, but I feel like that was that it's was the free value map. in this. That uh, it's extra mobs, it's an extra it map, it drops maps, you get a bunch of stuff, it doesn't remove the influence, so you can repeat the process. And you know, you can do uh you can somewhat at least in the lower tiers, I mean you can pretty much have influenced mobs like below 16 watchstones. You can have influenced mobs in every map. And, and the, it's endless. And the mobs that are added so, to you are not insignificant either. I mean, they are yeah, sort of yeah. like the Elder Portal. Remember when, you know, the Elder Ring yeah. was a thing and you always wanted to get the no portals. I mean, it's like that level of mobs being added to the game. The the, the packs are chunky. Like, mm -hmm. it's not just like a couple of squids. Yep. So I think that was the mentality in, in having it done this way. Where, yeah, you do have like kind of this free shit that you can do, but you can't... Uh, work your way with sextants when it comes to it, which isn't perfect for sure. Mm -hmm. 
but I don't know. yeah, I, I still, it feels, even if it is balanced, it feels like an arbitrary no, like sure. in your face. And that's not fun. So I'd rather but what they... about what about moving your uh, watchstones to and moving your sextants with the watchstones? That feels like a big yes, though. Oh, that's great! I love yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> so... I mean, maybe just the intention was there was all this sort of like focus around like super juicing all of your maps, and maybe this was just their answer to it. That like maybe like the top end of what you needed to do wasn't that that you could kind of enjoy it at a more casual investment as well. You can. And that's stop that's there. sort of like my um my favorite part about the new Atlas changes too is like being a more casual player myself. Like I I, I certainly don't interact with the game at a, a level that you guys do. And what I, I like the most about it is that this new Atlas can also help people feel accomplished, even if they have shorter amount of play times. Um something that was kind of like not bad about the old system, but like would make people feel like they were running behind was like, oh, I don't have this shape yet. I haven't gotten my Elder Orb. I can't do this content because I haven't beaten the quest line. And what's really cool is that a more casual player can sit down and get a watch zone and a single, you know, like a couple of hours that they have after work or on the weekend and like, yes, I got another one. And then so it almost is like is like a cookie crumb trail for the more casual progression based player. And I think that's more rewarding to them in the long run as well. It's a really fine tight walk to walk though for our tight rope to walk for GG though because if they've made a mistake in the system and there's a back door through which you can sneak a strategy in that is you know provably 10 percent or 20 percent more optimal than just doing it as they built it to be intended then well that already exists suddenly yeah it has it, plenty it of does. strategies right now um suddenly people start getting that feeling that you were talking about earlier of you know missing out but the system isn't as conducive to fixing your fuck up if you did fuck up in air quotes because you can't uncomplete maps and your influence doesn't allow you to like resext it and there's so many just like hard stops in this system as compared to the old atlas system i think they will have to address some of these issues though because in like the the way around it currently is to create secondary accounts, dummy accounts, and smurf accounts, like whatever the hell you want to call it. Like, so that's honestly just actually making more work for them in the long run in terms of like character migration at the end of the leagues. It's more dump tabs that they have to manage and stuff like that. I feel like they're going to have to either say something about why this design was done a certain way and either like accept the fact that people are going to go around it anyway, sort of like how the elder ring was a manipulation of like the way the elder influence behaved, or they're going to have to give a little bit and give some of these options back to us so for anyone who doesn't know before we get into it briefly what we're kind of talking about is i believe carve is currently doing this he reset his ssf atlas and now he's purposely only unlocking certain maps on his atlas because we currently can't remove them so because of that by fully planning out your atlas progression beforehand you have a more efficient atlas setup sorry go on well on that on that little note i think that's something they need to address for sure Right, there needs to be, but that was something we were worried about from the beginning, right? It, this is not something that wasn't, it's just probably something that they are going to address over time because this was brought up a lot. And I know at XLCon as well, a lot of players brought up the, well, what if we just don't complete some of the maps in the beginning? And it's like, oh, well, I can, I can tell Neon uh, definitely said that this is not good behavior. So I know like they, they don't like that behavior at all. It's just like limitations with the systems that they have. In terms of whether or not this system will be better or like or worse than the the old one, like from what Tegan is saying, like that they have to get everything right. I don't, I don't entirely agree that you can't have a ten percent out like outlier and then people will then feel forced to do it because the system is so open and you have so many you have so much room to fail. In the old system, it was like a pyramid, right, where you. You had to go through all these fat layers in the bottom and it kind of edged into this like little thing in the end that was like super hard to get to. And then you had to like, there was like no room outside of that once you, and then you found you finally got there. We ended up with this like, oh, if I ever want to like diverge away from this, it's nearly impossible. It's like a full reset or I need to like spend hundred sextants to you know redo my atlas now it's like way more open-ended you can just play sextants where you want there's tons of maps this system actually i think it's great 
with having an abundance of mats. In the, in, the, in the past, having too many mats kind of, uh, it took away a lot of the progression that you felt, but now you just want more. So more, more, more mats. So you can experiment more. You could jump around the Atlas. Oh, I need to get this like base type. Oh, I need to get that base type. Oh shit, I have these combinations of sex sets. Oh, they, they work perfectly down here where I don't uh, influence or whatever. Like it, it just, it really encourages to experiment a lot more. So even if players have this, like there is this one strategy that's better, you don't feel like you're punished as much by not being there. And the, I, I not only do I agree with Nugi so much, but also I think it's very important to have little fuck ups constantly yeah. with this system. And that happens nonstop. Like there were hundreds of times where I was doing my Atlas and I went, shit, if I move this watchstone he here while running this instead of there, then this would have worked out better for me, but I didn't. I didn't think it through enough. I fucked up. I could have manipulated the RNG a little bit more in my favor and gain access to something that I previously couldn't if I just thought about it a little bit more. And having that at the back of my mind constantly, I I love that so much that there's there's a thought process and it's a lot more intuitive than an elder ring or yeah. sextant blocking <laughs> or influence cornering and all the stuff that we had previously, which just sucked. Now yeah. everybody constantly can think about it. Sure, there's going to be people who are just going to be. And it, yeah. also what's really important about this is that the people, it's kind of like the tool that we talked about, right? With uh, Mugbase tool where it's so good where you constantly go, oh, this is bugged but it's actually you making a mistake, I would get that all the time with people <laughs> who are just like, my Atlas is bugged. It's not dropping this. It's not giving me this. I'm supposed to get this. This has to spawn. Where are the maps? And 99% of the time, the answer was, you just fucked up. You didn't right. figure it out. And I love that. Um, since we have a lot of people who'll be watching this who maybe haven't had much chance to play or they're starting the league late, would you guys like to just give any like tips for progressing the Atlas that you having learned from this point? Uh, small thing that I didn't learn until rather late. Every time you do a Zana Atlas mission, her inventory resets. Every time. So the ones that like you get as a little counter in the in the Zana icon ticker on your on your Atlas. Whenever you do one of those, so not a random Zana that spawns in a map, whenever you do one of those Atlas missions, her inventory will reset, which is very useful for progressing through the Atlas as you'll be able to buy into yellows when you need them or buy into reds when you need them. Right. But also great late game because she can sell synthesis maps or elder or guardian or shaper guardians. So every time you do one, check her inventory yep. and buy the relevant maps. Yep. And if you're struggling for currency too, but in a certain like progression state of your Atlas, you know, if she sells you a Phoenix map, you can turn around and put that up if you're in trade. I mean, it's also a good way to make some passive coin if you are more casual. Although the elder maps, the cheaper maps cost like eight and sometimes I think 12 and 16 chaos. Pretty, pretty intense. They sell for about 50. Ooh. Yep. <laughs> it's a good deal anyway. <laughs> I would say overall, uh, cater the Atlas to the strength of your build. Uh, so seek the most fun with it. Is is the number one tip because I number one tip for me because I try to really be very like strategical and and, and rigid about my atlas and like I'm gonna do it this way because this is how it's been done and in reality the best way to do it was just focus on your character uh, and focus on progressing the atlas in a in a certain direction but like it'll come. And just, yeah, enjoy it. Because that progression is, to me, a lot more fun than what it was before. And initially, I was like, ooh, there doesn't seem to be as much here to do as previously. Because previously, you had, like, an end goal. Now that end goal isn't necessarily there. It's like a little progression that you're constantly doing something with. But, uh, no, I think now it's like, you do have... I can't remember who talked about it, but you do have that little... Oh, I did a conquer. I have an extra watchstone, and you're going to be doing that over the course of the entire league for the majority of people. And I think that's yeah, that's cool. One thing I've been experimenting with on the uh, on the atlas is, as I got my um my influence or my uh, completion, the the bonus real high. 
uh, I realized I don't need to make my map so hard because what's really fun this league is just being able to engage with all the different mechanics from, I mean, the metamorphs uh, are much more enjoyable when you don't put like monster life on on an eight second map so they have 80% monster life. So you just, I run them blue now. Because you get to the point where you can actually sustain all the way up to 16 maps by running blue maps. And then you can engage with a nice metamorph boss and have fun with that without feeling, oh, sh I'm going to pull my hair out with all these endurance charges and EE and resist and life and life and life and the potential one shot. So I think just work just... towards, you know, get those completion points and then just, you know, reap the benefits from like making your life a little bit easier is something I'm really enjoying. And it's very lucrative because you get to, you know, you get all those uh, nice organs on top and with the eight bonus and you kill the boss, which is now also a lot easier because you didn't roll the map really high. Like Riddle said, you get these like nice um, influence maps, like elder maps and shaper maps. They drop like there's a percent chance they drop on top. So just running more maps generates more maps. <laughs> and just just to pile on that. Imagine quick. that. <laughs> yeah, that's but that's it seems so <laughs> obvious, but it really well at least to me it wasn't like uh, when I died when Darky was doing the Awakener fight, and I was watching his stream when he did the fight, and you see he was the first person to do it, and it was fucking really impressive. But he was talking after a couple minutes about how he's basically been running blue maps for the last three days, and I'm just like. Wait a minute, this guy's a fucking genius because I think <laughs> back to what map I just died in. And it's like yeah, extra AOE, yeah. extra damage, two extra projectiles map. I look at my map tab, I've got fucking 70 T16s. Why am I running yellow maps? Right. Like, <laughs> and it completely like changed my perspective and I've been having a lot more fun since then where occasionally I can be like, oh yeah, it's time to, you know, it's time to put in a hard one. But generally... Yeah. I can kind of uh, optimize this around what I want to do rather than what I have to do to progress my Atlas. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, on that note, but slightly different, um, I was speaking to someone the other day and they were talking about how they were really struggling because it's like, oh, everything's so tanky now, everything's so rippy, my build can't handle it. And I was like, oh, what maps are you doing? And they're like, reds. And I'm like, well, just do some yellows. Like, you can still progress your Atlas, you'll also be fine. Just like hang out in yellows, save up some currency, level up, you'll get your 20, 21 gems, and then when you're ready, then go up into the reds. And like, yeah, but I can do red maps now, though. I'm like, well, no, you just said you can't because they're like, they're really tanky. So, you know. Um, it's like yeah. the, but it's got electrolytes argument there. Yeah. So you just got to think about it. It's like, yeah, maybe instead of alking and like rolling all your reds, do them blue. Or just like stay in yellows for a bit and just grind out a bit. Um, also, I think that's one thing that some people kind of screw themselves a little bit with the watchstones is they they see they can like fully upgrade like one area. It's so like oh cool they like rush it. I think that if you're playing like more casually, more slowly, and you haven't got the best build and you're playing slightly off meta, I think just kind of going like region by region, like okay I'll do all the regions one watchstone, then I'll do all the regions one one two, and just going slowly that it gives you that very clear progression path and it may not be the most efficient way of doing it but if you're like just trying to slowly work your way through i think that's a very clean way of going about it um rather than just like red maps right away my build is shit fuck this game delete See, you know? but that's the that's the thing i had a viewer who linked me his atlas because he was like this shit is fucking bugged like it it's just not dropping maps i was in red maps and now i can't even get out of white maps mm. And he was really angry about it. I was like, I, I got really pissed off. So he linked me his atlas, and it was literally white maps and four watchstones in the other one. Yeah. So he literally got the red maps, dropped out of red maps somehow. And then now he's like, I'm not dropping any red maps. I'm not dropping any yellows. And I'm running maps constantly. It's like, yeah, bro, you're running tier two maps. Like, what do you think is going to drop? You have no yellows on your atlas. Like, you know, <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? What do you do about this? Yeah. And again, for anyone who doesn't know, it's currently possible that you could do have an atlas of just red maps or just have like a mix of white and this and that other. So let's say that your atlas is just 12 plus. If a tier 10 map were to drop in the old system, it would have then rolled down until an available tier is on your atlas and you get that. Now, nothing drops because you don't have that on your atlas. So if you're struggling with your progression and you want a nice clean thing, have it so you've got maps from one through to ten so yes. that way the yellow maps can drop 
<laughs> right. And then you can then start building your red pool because you've then got 11s up. And then if you go through it that way, you can then start to build a base. Um, don't just be like, oh, I'm going to blast this one region when I've only got like one red map or something. Um, but the awakener bonus. Oh, it gives me bonus thing. Oh. Oh. I like it. No, I, I, like I know, like, for a lot of people, it's, like, extra tedious. Like, I've already completed the Atlas. Why do I need to do it again? But I, I don't know. I find it really fun. Mm -hmm. I like that it's, like, not over and done. Like, you haven't just completed everything, got your orbs, and then nothing ever happens again. It's kind of fun to have another objective. I'll no, I, gives I, you said, this I said bonus, but I meant the level. I, I like mm. both of them, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's both scaling. Yeah. It's the nice. bonus is actually really fun because... Mm. You will look at the map and it'll say Awakening 8. I'm like, wow, Awakening 8 bonus. It's like, whoa, I can't wait to get there. And I think some of the the way that they've incorporated like the the, the percentage for extra drops is really neat too. All uh, like the stronghold sort of strategy. I feel like that's going to be really good for like SSF, even though I've never played it. You know, getting a stack of like three chisels or sextants here and there too is going to be like a big thing for your guys' long-term sustainability. And um, it adds up. a funny result of the massive bat bonus to dropping higher tier maps is that the um, softcore trade map prices have actually been skewed for T14s being in some cases twice as expensive as T16s. Because if you're doing an Awakened 8 Atlas with a ton of Awakener bonus as well as bonus completion, you're actually less likely to drop a 14 than a yeah. 16 in a lot of cases. Yep. But people want the 14s still because they want to get their Awakener bonus. So like a factory, a T14 factory is worth more by like twice than any 16 in its in its region. That's my problem right now. I can't find like, I have some Awakener bonus I haven't unlocked yet because it's on the lower maps and they're just not yeah. dropping. Because they're becoming 15s or 16s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to like, run a tier below that, like reasonably, to actually find them if I really wanted yeah. to. Or take to, some I have to watch drop stones the watch zones out of, the, out of mm -hmm. the towers to get them. You need to go back to the three instead of four. I like that so much, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, That's cool. The mm. constant struggle and it's like. It's a good struggle to have. About it. Yeah. yeah. It's a Too good problem options. to have. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I know we're only two weeks into the league, but I'm just curious, um, how would you guys, we'll just go around the room, compare the current state of Metamorph two weeks in to the last few leagues? Much better. Yeah, Current same. state of Metamorph? Yeah. Just the league itself. Just the yeah. league. Just, just the league. Ignoring Conqueror. Just purely the league. I mean, there's definitely some balance issues that need to occur between like map metamorphs and otherwise, as well as some like right. overall improvements of visualization and some of the attacks, um, kind of being a little too overpowered with certain map mods, like extra proj with that sort of like um, Act Six dead guy buffet of projectiles that sucks like big time. Um, but overall, I feel like it's a really cohesive design that just needs tweaking. I'm still waiting for Rise I, to say something. I think I don't get it. I just really? yeah. I, I like Metamorph. I like having to make a choice. I like being in control of what's going to kill me or not. If I made the right decision or the wrong one. I like all of that. As a league, I don't feel like it's different from any other leagues. I, I enjoyed Blight the same way I enjoyed this. I enjoyed Synthesis the same way I enjoyed this. It's not... Yeah. I'd to me, it's, it's not a league that stands out, and it's not a league that, like, you know, is I'd much say it's quite it wasn't different supposed to fact. stand out, right? It was right. supposed to be a kind yeah. of a mellow Probably. league. Yeah. yeah, I think it's quite different though in the fact that this is our first non-timed league in quite a long time, and mm. even though Metamorph is point. very scary, considering the vast majority of players play in softcore and they could just like throw a couple of portals into a Metamorph if they need to. This is probably the most consistent level of reward we've had of any league in a long time. Like, Blight had fail states. Legion, if your build wasn't fast enough, you would get less currency. Uh, Synthesis was very complex for a lot of people. Whereas this has been a very consistent, very steady level of return. Um, and it's like, oh. if you, even if your build is dog shit, you can just brute force it through portals. So I feel like everyone's kind of on a pretty level playing field in that sense. See, I, f I feel like it's more punishing for softcore players than like any league before because there was no mechanic before that you had to actively engage with 
it was always brute forcing to me. And here it's like, if you fucked up with the metamorph, your choice is to exit the map. That's it. Like you yeah. will kill. not. Yeah. Yeah. You will Double not kill that thing. Chaos bomb. That's great. Yeah. You know. I <laughs> so if you just if you're just clicking body parts for the highest reward, I feel like it's super punishing. I don't I've know. never had to abandon a map. I don't think outside maybe like day one or something. Yeah, but you're also not the average player. As much yeah. as I like to give you crap for sucking, you know, you you'll you'll get a frost bomb, you know, when there's maybe if there's a region bomb. Or something <laughs> like maybe that. the average guy probably won't. Yeah. So it's like they, I feel like they can really fuck themselves over, and it's not easy, you know, it's not easy to accept leaving a map. Mm. It's hard as a streamer because everybody's like you, you yeah. might. How, how dare DPS, you? Yeah. Nice Quinn build. Yeah, but it's the, I feel like it's the same goes for other other people where they're just like, I am accepting. I'm a bitch. I don't I don't want this. So then you, they hit zero XP, zero portals, and they quit the game. <laughs> I don't know. I don't okay, I'm curious. Just chat. How many people in chat have legitimately abandoned maps because of like you fucked up spawning a metamorph this week? Not at the start of the leak, but like in the last week. Mm. I have. <laughs> I have many times. I definitely have. Yeah. I have a lot. <laughs> okay, that's fair. You put on soul browse, you realize, like, too late. It's like, oh, shit, these things, oh, I'm out. Uh, yeah. Flying. It's like, oh, solar eruption, nice. Mm, yeah, you put it in, and you're like, oh, I chose poorly. Yeah. Yep. This was a mistake. I am in danger. Yep. I remember... Uh, I think it was my second metamorph. It was in Act Four. It was one of those Kitava. Uh, what are they called? Oh, the heralds. Yeah, the oh, god. Oh. And they have the attack where they yeah. just, like, yeah, 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 yeah. balls, and I just like noped out of there <laughs> so fast. And I was like on the edge of my screen, and just one ball hit me out yeah. of like and fucking it sixty. You up. Yeah. And I'm just like, I dropped like twenty percent. Mm. Nope, nope, nope. I'd rather go fight Kitava right now. Like again, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> That was a really good clip. Yeah. That was a really good clip. I know the yeah. one you're talking about. Yeah. The other really spooky one is the uh, the zombies that shoot the spirits. The first time you encounter that, and your whole screen just kind of goes black, and you're like, "Oh, what's that?" Yeah. <laughs> 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 I saw. I I can't remember who it was, but somebody. I think it was Lily. Actually, she had like a really brutal rip with that. With it just released the projectiles. They didn't even drop, and she just. Instantly popped. It's just like, wait, what? <laughs> so crazy. I think what um, what Metamorph really like tells me in terms of a league or what it really, what I just really want them to do at some point. I know they don't like the idea, or I'm not sure if they do, but just, just do it again and update it and add more. Cause I feel like there's so much you can do with a system like this where you combine like why why stop here? It's kind of my my thought. Yep, give us super goop dad. Yeah. I want I want super goop dad. That's the message to take away from today's podcast. Yes. Yeah. Give us I super think... goop dad. I mean it's impossible, right? If it was a different league, I feel like maybe if it was like the next league, I feel like a month into it they could have been like, you're super goop dad, but this league... could they do like uh could they do maybe like, when they add it core again? they could add something new to it that's the only way i think about it. doing like small league again and then adding an addition to a, a, a previous league maybe so you don't just have the one thing that's something i think that they could like if do they, moving maybe if they roll it core and... add the extra the, layer they've hinted at that in the past i think the last time there was iteration on a league like that was incursion when they added extra rooms like the, the ghost yeah rooms. that's true and yeah, that was, true. if anything, kind of underwhelming. It was, it, no, they've added, like, the Legion room. They fucking know. They've added Legion room nice, for it and stuff. Um, so it, it's something that I think a lot of mechanics have, have room for additions in that regard. But GGG's incredibly rapid development cycle means that at least meaningful additions just don't happen. Oh, yeah. I guess that begs the question... Even though it's a little bit early, do you guys think Metamorph should go core? Yeah, fuck it, I'm down. Yes, sure. I think so. I'm super down. Um, I think 
I think there's even like an opportunity to sort of do like the V-Siri treatment too, because they knew that it was a good system, but they knew it was also flawed. Um, so maybe this is something that just goes around or away for a little bit before being re-implemented after being touched up a little. What would you touch up about it? Because when you said bestiary system, that scared the fuck out of me because I hate what they did to bestiary. <laughs> I mean, like, sure, like, nothing that we get in the core game will ever be as good as the League, period. I mean, that's, that there's just no instance where we get the same thing that we have in a League in the core game. It's always neutered or somehow reduced in some sort of way, whether it's rewards, XP, etc. Um, but I don't think we really had, like, an expansion of content while being put into core before. And I think that's, like, an opportunity here that would be really neat. I think uh, an implementation I would like would actually be um, they should add it in like Salome, like the new master missions. Mm. And the reason why that would be good is because then you could target which ones you need to combine instead of it just being random. And then they could, because then I would, and then I would love to have like combinations that would then unlock like an even greater boss or something that you could build towards. You know, they could add like an, an additional layer on top of it that we could figure out and they could add new combinations, you know, however they would like. I think... But it will require us to be a little bit, you know, smart with the system. That's something I would love personally. I think a really cool way of doing it, because they've even admitted this themselves and we've all kind of realized that this is basically best route 2.0. I think that a way of making this a cool system where they add it in core is kind of overhauling best route when you do it. So I don't know if you have Ironhar and Tain team up or if you replace one with the other or functionality, like how you do it. But this is Bestery 2.0 and it's just a better Bestery at this point. I think that's how I would go about it. Because we also have the issue that I like, I really like the current implementation of Blight. I think Blight is so much better now than it was during the League. But yeah. they can't just keep throwing NPCs at our hideout. Because we're going to get to a point where it's just like, how many fuckheads have we got in here? Like, this is getting a bit dumb, right? <laughs> yeah, so true. it's like, if Tane yeah. goes yeah, core yeah. as well, that's another person, yeah. that's another dot on the minimap. And then it's Whoa. like, by the time you get around to PoE 2, it's like, fuck it, let's have a city. And like, you've got like 80 different fuckheads in there, you got to talk to each one. And like, oh. I think that system's going away, though. With, Which one? Uh, the whole master system and like the way Atlas works with that i think that's gonna go away in poe 2.0 it's like how can they really because maps are timeless right yeah. but masters have an expiration date yeah, yeah. so as people yes pe as people right. yeah <laughs> so i wonder how they how they can do that if it's like they all had children and <laughs> you know, they're doing the stuff for you that's true I really wonder how they're going to do that. And I mean, overall, it, it's a little bit suspicious to me how they haven't come up with a better system for actually proccing the master missions. Oh, I, I was complaining to the master stream yesterday. Put, put it on the map device, dude. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I don't understand how, oh, how that's still like the system. That, yeah. It should be integrated in the map device, too. It's almost yeah. like a check bar. Yeah. Like, so you'd have the scrolling option where you would scroll which map device, and then it would be like an extended part of the bottom. And you would just like they would have each symbol, and then you would just check which symbol, select which map option, and then put the map in and go. Hmm. And like if you had that mission available, it would go. If not, it would give you like the warning, like it always does. But then it's all yep. integrated within the map system. You don't have to go all over to Timbuktu just to. I mean, because like if you enjoy creating hideouts, which is probably a smaller demographic of people, I mean, like it sucks to have to like make a cool hideout and then mm. have to run all the way to one side of it in order to not like. I used to enjoy that immensely, but I stopped making hideouts when this is that happened. Because so you just me. crowd everyone around the, the the center portal, and then that's that. It's it's so weird to me, especially because they make these fucking awful, huge UIs that are just absolutely unnecessarily big, in like the middle of the map, like Syndicate, and even to a certain extent Metamorph, where it's just like here's a huge fucking screen that covers up your entire gameplay and you have to make choices while the mobs nip at you like it's <laughs> not cool but then the map device is so like tight and tight and neat and just put it like on the side so you click like a little a yeah. little face and it's yeah. done yeah. It's, it's really weird yeah it's very as someone who's still like really into hideouts it's really frustrating um 
like really fucking frustrating with the current system of hideouts and also just to complain about it briefly the celestial nebula hideout they released on the store pisses me the fuck off it's cool i'm gonna get it eventually i'm broke but i'll get it when it's on sale it's got a completely flat floor and having a flat floor is the biggest deal in the world if anyone's ever played sims the way that current path of exile works imagine sims but every fourth square fucks all your tiles because all the floors are like this. So the fact that it's a completely flat floor is so overpowered. Like, that's the, that's the best thing about it. And they're like, give me some money. Like, no. Like, oh. Yeah. Man, I was looking over my MTXs yesterday. And I was remembering the speech about, like, does this MTX... Ruined the integrity of our art design. <laughs> and then I was looking oh, over all uh, the like clown MTX. Clown, and yep, I knew where that was yeah. going. I was just like, Jesus, what happened? People are complaining. Turn your hair into, into a paintbrush that's multicolored. Yeah. <laughs> RGB paintbrush hair. Yep. Are you trying to tell me the new weird pla Do you guys like the new boxes? They look fucking dumb to me. They're like plasticky and shit. Boxes. boxes. Ooh. I feel like you have to like the Elon Musk van to like these. They're like, yeah, kind of, yeah, like they're kind of like old school. <laughs> oh, Jesus, <laughs> they're kind of like old school. I, I, in a way, I like them. They're very boomer, like like hard edges, and they're still well well made. But you, you have to, if yeah, you're you like to proper really into good. Power Rangers, I can see it because they've got that kind of like early like 90s 2000s live action cheap tv show kind of vibe to them but they look very plasticky what we're talking about the description you, you got your stream you got three boxes right noogie the new boxes so just the you, are we just talking about the mystery box yeah like the actual look of the box yes we're, we talking talking about the the... <laughs> yes. Noogie. Exactly. we're talking about the actual fucking box noogie we're not talking about the armor sets inside the box we're talking about oh, the, okay. the rectangular thing in the ui <laughs> <laughs> jesus <laughs> fuck I'm dude like, how much sleep have you had nah. since league stuff dude, no but you keep saying box i'm like what are we talking about here are we actually talking about a box or what like and then you start talking about the test i'm like looking up the box i'm like i guess this looks like a tesla <laughs> i mean <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anything else we need to cover? <laughs> it's got some right angles too. Okay, I, I think yeah, I think that's probably the end there. I think right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess Riddle it looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brittle, I'd like to thank you for coming on, and I look forward to talking to you about the shape of boxes uh, next week. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for having me. It was quite the opportunity, and I appreciate it. Uh, where can people find you and all that cringe stuff? Um, I've got, <laughs> what? I got I stream on Twitch. I just don't I, actually I come find me because we all stream um, on Twitch. Sorry, I interrupted. Sorry, sorry, gone. <laughs> No, it's fine. Um, but slash Brittlenie is the Twitch channel, and then there's some Twitters and stuff too. But we stream in the mornings, mm -hmm. US time, eight o'clock in the morning to about two or three in the afternoon. I don't know. I know this is my own podcast. So I don't need to do that, but I feel bad when we have guests on. I don't give them a chance to plug. But it's like, unless you're that dude whose name is completely different to your screen name, it's always just like Google me. You did. You did two mistakes with this. You should be the one plugging it, so yeah. it doesn't make the other person feel embarrassed okay. about it. Yeah. The other thing is the hosting thing. You always go like, "Who wants a host?" and everybody's I like, done that "I don't, okay, I don't want to like, be a leech." So it's like, you know, you this needs to be figured out before. Yo, Brittle, you streaming after this? Uh, no. Oh. I'll be streaming Monday morning though. And then I think they're going to be doing the, the full guide on the Darkness Farmer. is going to be coming out Monday night. All right, guys. We need to stay live until Monday morning. So uh, okay. getting back to those boxes. I mean, if Camel and I can fill eight hours of conversation about posture, snacks, and uh, Carve's mysterious soup bowl, I think we got this. <laughs> She's got a schedule, Tarsus. You know, not still, better than that, still better than that time you yelled at Chris to leave. That was great. As far as outros yeah, go for good. day class. <laughs> True. It's pretty unbeatable. At this I was really tempted when we were in his office and about to leave to tell him, say, oh, you can leave now. I was so tempted to do it, but I was like, I don't know if I've got the balls to do it, like in a reverse, you know, kind of vibes. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, Octavian, are you, are you streaming after? I'm just doing this to annoy Bryce now. You can be. Can be. Can be. Would you like to be? Sure. There you go. Octavian gets it. Sick. See, but Octavian is probably the one who puts up with this the best, and he still felt really awkward about that. Right? <laughs> Slightly. Yeah. Mm. But I had fun, so it was worth. Uh, yeah, well. And the only reason I do Bay Class is because I enjoy it. I don't do it for the community. It's just it's just an opportunity for me to talk to people. See, but people miss Yeah, I'm the opposite. Oh, really? Was, yeah, was, was, sure. was, 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 <laughs> people miss that a lot. People are like, entertain us. And they don't get that. A lot of this is just like us actually wanting to talk to each other. So <laughs> it just ends up sometimes being entertaining when Tarki doesn't talk a whole lot. And yeah, like that's ones. the podcast. Hey, I did really good. I said very little until like the middle-ish bit, and then I started talking. At least you guys yeah. are good at talking. I literally talked until I couldn't breathe and then had to stop, so you got the talking thing down. <laughs> <laughs> you did get a little shaky at some point where you're like, ooh, is it time to step in? <laughs> <She can't... laughs> that, was... that was good, though. I've never had the opportunity to tell like the story. You did so very well. Really you did cool. really well. No, I, I'm very See? impressed. But that's the thing. I, you know, I wasn't going to break down over here. But honestly, that was that was really inspiring. That was really, I love that. And you do a lot for the community. And I really appreciate it because I feel yeah. as one of those people that you described as, you know, frustrated boomers uh, when it comes to racing. It did get to a point where it was like, yeah, really exhausting to try and keep this thing going. And uh, a lot of people left. And for you to step in. Uh, with that group of people and kind of bring it to another level, I, I have I great mean, appreciation. For I it, think there's so. a huge Thank potential. You. I mean, we straddle a really weird divide between speed racing and like POV esports. And I think as we learn what works in firm as casting, like so, what kind of cast we need to do with what events, because there's no like base plane for or like template for what POV racing is. It's a 70 race. It's a 77 race. Yeah. It's a 100 race. It's a race until the first guy is dead. I mean, like it can only get better. Like, we'll figure it I, out. We'll um, figure out how to correlate what cast to what type. So, like, maybe a 100 race or something like this in the past becomes more of, like, a almost like a news broadcast instead of, like, 24-7 coverage where we just hit upon the rip clips yeah. and, you know, like, we can figure this out. We can make it better. Be live for, like, an hour or two every eight hours to, to cover all the important exactly. stuff that happened and then, and then go down until the next the next step or and, you know have people on standby who could potentially be there if something exciting is about to happen you want live and as far as the um like the development is con concerned like we still have plenty of plans as far as what we want to do like of course the end pro the end goal is to get um more of the api exposed so we don't have to do some of the circumvention like sort of like methods of getting stuff like atlas exports or a lot of the ways that we've been thinking about trying to make like a at a glance armory extension too so where we could click on somebody's stream and then their entire what they're wearing would just pop up over their cast um like there's so much that we want to develop as well i'm gonna i'm gonna be honest like i really don't think it's possible to overstate the work that went on behind the scenes and how important it was in reviving path of exiles racing scene like i don't think there would have been an exile con race without the work that people like Gretel and McVeigh and Pertinax and Camel put in. I mean, I think if you, because... if you put, if you took all of our hours, as far as like just development hours, um, it would exceed 200. And if you think about software development, that is not a cheap, um, you know, like software devs get billed anywhere between like 35 to $50. If you're like a junior tech all the way up to like 150 hours plus, And some of the people that are working for us, are like up there in the scale of like what they do in real life. And they're dedicating those hours to us for free as like a completely volunteer basis. It would not surprise me that the development having been done on Path of Excel already would exceed $10,000 of billable time. Yeah. All I'm saying is racing felt like that one relationship where you both put in a lot of time and effort and that shit just ain't working and you're screwed and you guys stepped in and made it work. So again, huge appreciation. Like Octavian said, it, it really means a lot. Get and I don't think you guys hear that enough. It's my pleasure. I just want to see it succeed. Awesome. Are we done with the podcast? When did it end? Did uh, it... The podcast ended, but that was really good. So I kind of feel like we should include that bit. So we should probably include the rambly bit in the middle where you're like, 
shiitake. You gotta do the hosting thing. Ugh. But now <laughs> we you have to end it on you saying that instead of me being all teary eyed and shit. So well, yeah. we'll just clip that last bit out. It'll be fine. But um, we'll get like a nice, really slow piano solo to kind of like augment the the teary eyed okay, so, okay, and this really. Is, this is actually what's gonna happen. I'm just gonna upload fucking everything because that's really what I'm gonna do anyway. 